let's let's grab our seats so we can get started. We've still got some promoting to happening happening on Zoom. Uh, everyone who's here in person should be logged into the Zoom link. Um, take yourself off of audio so we don't get the feedback. And uh, you'll get if you're again if you're here in person, you'll get promoted on the Zoom to um, I think presenter status. All right. With that, on the technical stuff, let's uh, go ahead and call this meeting to order. Oh, my camera. Meeting to order uh, is at 1046. We're one minute late. Um, so welcome to all uh, NAC members, uh, participating, all the guests uh, to this um, to this meeting. Um, uh, first, uh, uh, first order here is to acknowledge the NAC members who term, whose term ends at the end of this month, and we have a few of them. Um, so keep them in mind because I'm going to call back. I'm going to call you guys again at the end of the at the end of the meeting. So the folks whose uh, terms, the NAC members whose terms end at the end of the month are Andy Auerbach, Carolyn Carney, Kathy Ivory, Mireille Jacobson, David Schmitz, Jadrika Brown Spates, and Henry Ting. So those folks will um, rotate off at the end of this month. Um, more uh, on some on the housekeeping. So first of all, thank you all for your service, and um, we will have more. Uh, we have more from you later later today. Actually, um, for it, for all NAC members who are um, who are on site, we will have to have a full NAC photo op at lunchtime. So be prepared for that. Don't rush right off to lunch. Hold and um, let's take photos. And then for those of you who are rotating off, I think you're going to get right. I'm going to get an individual uh, uh, photo here with uh, with Dr. Valdez. So you guys will hold in. We're going to get we're going to get good photos for you guys. Um, on the again, back to some of the um, logistics of the meeting itself. Again, all NAC members should be logged into the Zoom. Pop your video up. Um, use the raised hand function during discussion so we can kind of track you. And what happens is when you raise your hand, you actually, I can see you in order of who raised your hand. So I'll, I'll march through and, and call you guys based on your raised hand function. Um, but that way that NAC members who are actually not here in person can also um, contribute. Um, on occasion when you're on Zoom and you're talking, Zoom will say unmute so that because it's hearing you talk, don't do that if you're here in person. Um, a reminder also, this, this meeting is being recorded and it'll be posted on the um, ARC website once it's available. Uh, closed captioning is available for the meeting as well. If you need closed captioning, click on that icon. It should be at the bottom of your screen. All right, so for today, what we will do, and you can see the bullets up on the slide here, um, we're working on the, the first part, um, including the approval of minutes, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, we'll get an update from um, our director and some highlights. Uh, we'll talk about CAPS. We'll talk about two snacks, um, one on uh, the National um, Action Alliance to Advance Patient Safety and one on the PCOR Trust Fund. We'll have our uh, public comments and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up. Um, on the public comments, we will, uh, like we did last meeting, um, we started in, in a, and I think we have a, a nice refined process. For the public comments, you um, we will be taking in um, uh, those comments and we'll be engaging um, kind of real time uh, through Zoom. Um, to make a comment in, chat, in the chat, um, send an email to the National Advisory Council at HRQ dot um, hhs.gov and um, a, a member of the team will actually post it into our chat so we can we can uh, we can see it um, here and put real time post in the subject line. 
um, anyone who wants to do um, to make a verbal uh, public comment, send that email with a subject line, um, a public comment by 1.15 Eastern today. Um, comment should be three minutes. Um, and um, just, just a note on, on both forms of comment, they should be um, respectful, um, no ridicule or obscene or profane language, personal attacks will not be accepted in public comment. Um, be brief and to the point and, and, and very preferably addressing issues that are on the meeting agenda. Um, NAC members should not be responding directly to those comments, either the public comment um, verbal or the ones that are in um, the real time uh, posts. So with that, we will just hold one sec, please. <clears throat> We will go through um, and we'll get a, a bit of a roll call here. Just gonna pull up my uh, others, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna go um, again, I hope you all are on Zoom. So I'm gonna, um, I'm also gonna look at the Zoom uh, when we do it, when we're working on the roll call. Um, let's see here. Just making a note of who's not gonna be here as well. Okay. Oh, the list. I can just go around the room too. Yeah, but you can check. Oh, that way I can check them off. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So I'm going to just run the list here and just. Um, jump in and um, announce that you are here. I know this person's not here. Andy Arbeck. Uh, Kamal's not here. She's oh. She's online. oh, Kamal Bajaj. No, there she Morning, is. Okay. everyone. Great to be joining you virtually. Good to see you. Good to see you. Carolyn Carney. Morning, everybody. Sorry not to be there today. I have a, another presentation to give this afternoon. So it's great to see you all and sadly to say goodbye later. Oh, thanks. Uh, Al Carter. Here. <clears throat> there we go. Um, Joan Gelrude. Here. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Neil Gofar. Shoot. Cincy Hernandez Cancio. Hi, I'm here. Sorry to not be there in person. And here's not a beach. That's just aspiration. I, I, I was hoping it was. Uh. <laughs> Krista Hughes. Here. Kathy Ivory. Here. Me Ray's not here, right? And not online. I'm on Zoom. Sorry. Right. I, I will have to leave to go teach. Um, so sorry to not be there in person and um, sorry to rotate off, but um, with you in spirit. Good to see you, Mary. Um, Elizabeth Mort. Okay, I didn't see you on Zoom. Okay, thank you. Kanan Ramar. Hi, good morning. Uh, joining virtually. Gotcha. Gina Reyes. Who's my group? I am here as well. David Schmitz. Dedrika Brown Speets. Here. Yep. yep. Henry Tang. Is he? No, I don't see him either. Okay. Remember, Joe? Yeah, so I'll fix this here first. Um, any, if there's any ex officio members, um, let me go through the list here. Oh, God, okay. But I don't, let's see, let me just make sure I got that because I know Ron's coming for CMS. This is Ron, right? 
Okay. Okay. Yep. Shown true share. Okay. 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 So, Tom Buck Mueller. Okay. Amy Kilburn. Okay. Michael Lauer. I don't see him on. No, I don't either. Okay. And Ron Klein, you're for Sherry. Yeah. Okay. Ron. Ron's here. Anyone I'm missing? Am I missing any ex officio members? Okay. All right. Did I miss anyone? Gotcha. All right. <clears throat> So um, you guys may have noticed that we have one uh, new uh, representative from the ex officio uh, membership. We have the, um, uh, the Office of Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, ASPE, is being represented by uh, Tom Beckmiel. You may have recognized, um, <laughs> recognized Tom here, but he's in a different role now. Um, and so uh, here to represent ASPE, well, welcome back, um, representing, uh, representing ASPE um, as, as um, on here on the NAC as an ex officio member. So I, I know you tried to escape, but we <laughs> <laughs> pulled you back in. <laughs> All right. So we are now on to, yeah, we have to do, we do have to do that, don't we? Um, so the uh, first um, uh, order of business um, is approval of the minutes from the July 12th, I believe that's the meeting. Uh, it's from July 12th meeting, uh, 2023. So first, um, are there any recommended changes or edits to the, the draft minutes that have been sent around from the 7-12-23 meeting? Seeing none, do I hear a motion to approve those minutes? Moved and seconded. Um, any objections to approving of those minutes? Seeing and hearing none, that motion carries. Those minutes are approved. Um, at this time, we'll turn the meeting over to our director to provide the director highlights. Well, thanks very much. And uh, as Tom is an, a good illustration, and as I mentioned when we first met, uh, once I've got my teeth in you, I never let you go. So uh, while some of you may be rotating off, uh, it, it doesn't mean we're saying goodbye. It's only saying until the next time. And uh, I wanna first of all, thank all of you for, for your contributions and, and we'll get a chance to thank you properly as, as the meeting goes on. Um, let, let, me, uh, uh, let me begin this presentation, first of all, by reminding you uh, of what I said when we started this, this journey together. Yeah, and that is that increasingly during my tenure, I want to want to put the Q back in HRQ, um, and that is a real focus on quality, and picking up those discussions that that the arc uh, that that the NAC began prior to my um, my coming on board, and also the first part of my agenda, which was to begin to ask the question: How do we measure and how do we know we're providing high quality care? in all the different settings that people receive healthcare these days. In the past, when ARC started 35 years ago, most people got their care either in a doctor's clinic or in the hospital. I know some of you still remember those days. I almost don't remember those days because I'm getting further along and I'm beginning to, to forget things um, uh, uh, just as, as many of us do as we we fill our own heads with so many things and many priorities. But what I wanted to do today was just to remind everybody that when we talk about quality, we're really talking about the six domains of quality. And as you'll see throughout the course of our agenda over the last more than a year and a half together is that we've begun to touch on each one of these domains and we'll continue to do so uh, as we work through improving the quality of care, which is the way in which we pursue the mission of ARC, which is to improve health care in the United States, in every community, in every little town, in the rural communities, as you'll note, our, our colleagues next door are having a whole rural health day uh, focus and, and, and examination. 
And you'll see that increasingly uh, the experiences of, of Americans in rural communities is so different from the experiences of people in urban communities. The perceptions of what the COVID pandemic was all about differs dramatically whether you lived in a city or whether you lived in a rural community or whether you even lived in a suburbs. So how we take those perceptions and recognize that those perceptions affect how people think about healthcare, their healthcare experience, and the quality of care that they receive is central to the work that we try to do. And we try to understand, not only for us to understand, to inform policymakers, but for us to develop the tools and the mechanisms by which healthcare providers and the systems within which they provide services can make and improve services for patients, for their consumers, for the users of their, of their systems. Well, we started out this journey and, and I've kind of outlined three major objectives while I'm here. And that is uh, the first being to improve local healthcare system performance. Uh, because as, as I've tried to stress, we don't have a national healthcare system. We have many healthcare systems that are largely operated and controlled and, and, and developed and regulated by the states. Um, and so healthcare systems that operate in multiple states are actually operating under multiple rules. People who practice, practice in a state, they have to get a license in a state sometimes if they wanna practice in another state or even in their own health system, they've gotta get licenses in other states. So recognizing that, we also recognize that one of the greatest issues that we're dealing with in American healthcare is the fragmentation that exists. So as a strategy to improving healthcare performance, we're trying to do three strategic things, reduce fragmentation. And we'll talk about that through some of the actual activities that we're doing, uh, patient and workforce safety improvement, which is topic of today. We've previously talked about long COVID and best practices for primary care with a real focus on primary care transformation and really understanding and aligning the financial incentives. ARC doesn't deal with the financials, but we do in a sense of trying to help establish the standards of care and, and those standards that guide the development of guidelines. Um, increasingly, we're also recognizing that we need to deal with the tsunami of aging in our society. And that is the transformation of care that's necessary for an aging society, particularly at the primary care level. And to reduce the inequities that really have underlined the decreasing life expectancy in the United States uh, since 1977, really, that decline began. And it's been a steady decline for all these decades, uh, particularly more dramatically since the 1980s, and especially seen and observed publicly during the pandemic. But what's at the root? Much of what's at the root are these inequitable care delivery arrangements and systems that are structurally embedded in our systems of care. Oh, I should go back and say, one of the things that we're trying to do is work with the, the National Academies of Medicine um, to, to re-examine the look at unequal treatment. And so the charge to, to NAM in the report, which we are expecting in, in this next year, is really to help us understand how do we vanquish unequal treatment rather than simply telling us that there are differences in the, in the way that people are receiving care or that we see health disparities. Um, the second major uh, objective has really been about expanding access to high quality and affordable care. And the president and the, de and the department has taken a, a real focus on these areas, in particular looking at the opioid crisis, looking at uh, emergency services for suicide. Um, what has been missing is really the establishment of real standards of care across the continuum. And that's some of the work that we're trying to do to address the issues that you raised and that we discussed about how do we really understand care quality in the United States in all the different places in which people receive care. So we're looking also at how we integrate behavioral health care into primary care. Again, another transformative focus on primary care. 
Um, and one of the things that we'll be talking about today are investments that we're making at ARC to lean into our dissemination and implementation uh, function. And in particular, a focus on how do we reduce the time from innovation of scientific discovery to actually getting it into the clinic. And you know, some of the scientific estimates have been somewhere between 17 and 20 years it takes from discovery to, to actually finding its way into standards of care. Can we cut that in half? I'm hopeful that we can. And, and I think you'll hear more about how we're thinking about that uh, later on today. And, and I look forward to your suggestions for how we can, we can pursue that. The last uh, really area has been, how do we really recognize the need to keep healthcare systems resilient in an all hazards way of thinking? The pandemic, which was a biological hazard, um, is just one of many hazards that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. There are floods going on, as some of you who watched the news last night. There are fires that go on uh, periodically across the country. So these kinds of hazards have often strained healthcare delivery systems around the country. And some of the biggest issues that haven't been addressed is how do we in fact create healthcare systems that are resilient to all the different types of hazards in their particular geographic region and locality. People are doing things, but the science space for what works, what needs to be thought of, and the, the technological innovations that are necessary to make them resilient have not been at the forefront of the work that, that people have done. And so I'm hopeful that we can add ARC's voice and advice in this area and in the years to come. So I thank you. And as we begin to talk about today, you'll notice that a number of the topics that I've raised are in the strategic work that we're trying to do. And I look to you for strategic advice for how we actually move this work forward, how we make it better, and how we make it more responsive to your part of the healthcare ecosystem. Because each of you touch the healthcare system and patients from different perspectives. And we need those multiple perspectives and diversity of perspectives to actually make all our work better. So don't be shy. I know you won't be. I, at least I hope you won't be. Um, even if you think, well, that's been raised, emphasize it. And, and I encourage you to, to speak up. And uh, whether you're here in the room or whether you're out there in the internet, uh, and most of our most vocal folks and have sent me emails and I try to reach out to you on a regular basis, but please, this is our opportunity to be together. And in, in groups, I find that to be a much more exciting and uh, helpful way of, of thinking about and, and blue skying what, what needs to be done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vedas. So um, if there's any clarifying questions uh, for the director's report out, um, please jump on. Otherwise, much of the content and the questions associated with that content will be covered in the rest of the meeting. Um, so for clarifying questions, um, I see, uh, Cincy, uh, go for it. I see you up on the... Um... Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I was just, there was an announcement earlier this week about the an interagency effort to um, improve the research among women. Um, and I was just wondering if there was anything you could um, share or add about how that affects the work, will be affecting um, the work of ARC. I, I believe you're talking about the, the, the announcement that was made in, in the White House announcement uh, earlier this week on women's health. Um, Yes, there's there's an increased emphasis and focus on women's health, but I, I'm glad to say that part of what fed into that uh, announcement is much of the work that's already been done at ARC, uh, particularly around uh, continents-related uh, issues and recommendations. Uh, we're also focusing increasingly on on some of the work that that um, that's been of great interest around menopause and, and elsewhere, we've got some uh, evidence review work that's going on and, and other activities. So uh, I think it's it's a great opportunity to highlight the need to focus on, on women. And as the US Preventive Services Task Force knows, uh, in my discussions with them, as we talk about uh, 
preventive services, uh, I've always encouraged them to be sure to look at and, and to raise uh, the issues around treating women and, and men uh, and to take those very, very seriously. Because we do know some major uh, differences uh, and often uh, the fact that many recommendations in the past and, and, and other kinds of studies have largely focused on evidence from men and, and not included an adequate um, sampling of, of women. And so um, I know that they are doing in their considerations work in that area. So uh, in many ways, I, I'm, essentially I'm, I'm glad to say that, that there's been a, a higher visibility to the work that we're doing and also a greater emphasis uh, to the need to focus on the health of women in the research settings in particular. Caroline, a uh, clarifying question. Uh, just a quick comment on being delighted to see the integration of behavioral health into primary care, especially looking at where many of the federal funding streams are going, directing dollars into communities for this purpose. So I think it's a huge opportunity for ARC to uh, measure the outcomes and the quality of those kinds of initiatives. Great, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Valdez. Let, let's um, let's hand this one over now um, on the, from the agenda perspective. Thanks for the uh, director's report out. Let's pull uh, Greg Upsheet up, uh, uh, Greg Upsheet uh, up to um, to give the next uh, talk and conversation around CAPS around the CAPS program. Right. So Craig is the uh, director for for ARC's uh, Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety. Um, he's got a, a team. That's gonna that's gonna jump in as well, right? And talk about this uh, this topic, engage around this. We did have some work. Uh, we had some pre work um, at the NAC members to um, talking about this as well. So we'll we'll get into that uh, um, also. But let's let's jump right into this 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 discussion. So Craig, it's all yours. Thanks, Edmundo. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see your faces. I'm grateful for the opportunity to start our session on the CAPS program. Um, I wanted to begin by sharing how important the CAPS surveys have been to me in my quality leadership roles across my career and the significance that I place on this program as the new director of the Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety. As some of you may know, uh, I've spent the bulk of my career in large academic healthcare systems leading quality and safety programs. First as vice chair of quality and safety in the Department of Medicine at Penn in Philadelphia, uh, and then as chief quality officer at UChicago. I share this because when I was in these roles, the CAP surveys played a critical role in helping us understand and improve patients' experience of care and garner resources from the institution to make the investments necessary to strengthen that experience. It was a real demonstration for me of if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Because with the CAP surveys, we could measure patient experience and thus we could improve it. And because there are such strong incentives at a systems level to perform well on CAP surveys, appropriate attention was paid to issues which are critically important to patients in our fragmented healthcare system, but historically may not have received the attention they deserved. Issues like do I have input as a patient on healthcare decisions? Are staff responsive to my concerns? Do I have opportunities for rest and recovery when I'm in the hospital? Do I receive clear information about next steps when being discharged from the hospital? Now, there are three themes that you'll hear from our presenters today that I'd like to emphasize up front because they're critical. The first is the importance of ARC's role as a research focus entity, which provides the appropriate environment for the development of surveys that meaningfully and accurately measure patient experience. And that can meet a standard of rigor such that they can be used by others, including CMS and the VA for high stakes initiatives such as pay for performance. The second is the importance that ARC places in including patients broadly in the steps used to develop and maintain the surveys. Last, the CAPS programs values opportunities to hear about your interests, concerns, feedback, 
And you'll hear that in our presentation as well today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our CAPS program experts who will be presenting today so that we can get started. Our first speaker will be Karen Ginsberg, who directs the CAPS program at ARC. Karen has a long history in public health. Uh, she's been at the CDC, she's been at the National Quality Forum, she's been at CMS, and she's been with ARC leading the CAPS program, as well as the Surveys of Patient Safety Culture program for years. Ron Hayes uh, will speak after Karen. Uh, Dr. Hayes is a distinguished professor of medicine and health policy and management at UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And he's one of the principal investigators for the CAPS program for ARC. And our last speaker will be Susan Edgman Leviton, who's the executive director of the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Susan is another principal investigator of the CAPS program uh, from the Yale Harvard uh, group. And if you review the bios of our presenters today, you'll see that they're luminaries in the field of advancing patient experience. So I'd, I'd encourage you to look at their bios if you haven't already, uh, just to get a sense of the deep contributions that they've made in this field. So Karen, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. It's so good to be here to, to uh, have the opportunity to talk with you about ARC's Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, or CAPS program. Can I have the first slide, please? Yes, thank you. ARC has been funding the CAPS program since 1990. 1995, and the program was started to address consumer needs for information uh, for choosing health plans. The initial questions that the program answered were what do consumers want to know, what are the existing sources of information, and, and importantly, whether the information that was available reflected the consumer perspective. ARC funded work that would address these concerns and develop a survey on patient experience with health plans that reflected what consumers wanted to know. Next slide, please. Over the past 28 years, the CAPS program has advanced the science of patient experience uh, and improvement through developing validated surveys and supplemental item sets. Or th these are, uh, these are uh, narrative or uh, open text items, developing quality improvement resources, such as our ambulatory care improvement guide, hosting voluntary databases for quality improvement and conducting research that has uh, advanced the science of patient experience measurement and improvement. We've acquired deep experience and expertise in measuring and improving patient experience. We provide support to the activities of, of the CAP survey users who rely on our tools and the resources that we generate. Next slide, please. I'd like to define patient experience for you. Patient experience is actually what happened to the patient or how often something happened to the patient uh, in a healthcare setting or with a health plan. It encompasses the range of interactions that patients have with the healthcare system. And this slide shows some of the elements of patient experience that are measured by CAP surveys. Patient experience is different from patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction refers to how patients feel about their care and whether their expectations for a healthcare encounter were met. The next slide, please. Patient experience is one kind of patient input and the CAP surveys are one way to collect information from patients. There are many other ways and here are some examples of how to collect patient input. The italicized methods that I have on this slide are those that the CAPS program addresses in some capacity, either by developing tools to collect the information or by discussing these methods, for example, 
in the Ambulatory Care Improvement Guide. I'm not going to read this. I'll just point out that CAP surveys are considered patient reported experience measures. And I wanna to point to PROMS, uh, which are patient reported outcome measures. They are clinical outcome measure, measures such as physical function, pain, fatigue, or depressive symptoms. I'd like to point out though, what I think is important to point out about this slide is that this is not a cafeteria menu. You can't just pick one and you're gonna understand what you need to know about patient experience in a healthcare setting. These methods are not sub, uh, substitutable for each other. Instead, they all complement each other. This, these strategies all contribute different kinds of information and all are useful in understanding what happens to patients in their healthcare related encounters. Next slide, please. CAP surveys ask patients to report on their experiences with a range of healthcare services at multiple levels in the delivery system. Some, uh, some surveys ask about patients' experience with healthcare providers such as clinicians or medical groups or hospice providers. Some ask about care for specific health conditions such as cancer care or mental health care. Other surveys ask enrollees about their care and health plans and related program. And finally, surveys, CAP surveys ask about experience with facility-based care such as hospitals or dialysis centers or nursing homes. Next slide, please. I wanna to point to some of the uses for CAP surveys. Uh, CAP surveys are used for quality improvement, public reporting, such as what you would see on the CMS Care Compare website, certification and recognition programs, value-based purchasing initiatives, and health services research. On the next slide, please. Uh, this is a somewhat complicated slide, but I, I, the purpose is to identify the organizational roles in the CAP survey process. ARC, as you know, has been described by Craig uh, and others today as, as a research and development agency, and we use standardized scientific processes to develop and test surveys to ensure that they are valid and can be used for the high stakes purposes that, that we've talked about. Based on our testing and our research, we also provide some recommendations about how to administer surveys. We also focus on, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, on some of the uh, elements of, uh, aft of the, some of the functions of uh, CAP survey, the CAP survey world after the data are collected, the quality improvement activities and the voluntary databases, for example, but I wanna focus on the research uh, to develop the surveys and what happens after they're developed. So once we develop and launch a survey, the survey sponsors or those who wanna use the surveys to meet their programmatic objectives are free to use, to use and implement the surveys. CMS, for example, as a survey sponsor, implements CAP surveys to support value-based purchasing or public reporting programs. Another example is NCQA, it's the use of the CAPS health plan surveys for accreditation purposes. And the sponsors, the survey sponsors are the ones who decide on the actual requirements for participating in their survey and their program. For example, the sponsors decide what modes of survey administration, for example, mail or phone or web or a combination of those are to be used to participate in their program or how often the surveys are administered or the lag time between a visit and when a patient needs to receive a, a CAP survey. The survey vendors administer the survey according to the sponsor's requirements uh, and protocols and submit the data to the sponsors. They format the surveys according to the sponsor's protocol and requirements and they work with their clients to add any additional supplemental items that the clients request. And there are some nuances here. CMS does develop some surveys, but essentially what this slide points to is, is the, how to differentiate the roles of development, sponsoring, and fielding the CAP surveys. The next slide, please. So I wanna talk about how we set priorities for CAP surveyor item set development. For background, the CAPS program funds contracts and cooperative agreements, which are like grants. The cooperative agreements are responsible for the development and the validation of the surveys and item sets, research on the survey methods and the quality improvement activities. Uh, Ron and Susan, who are here with me today, serve 
as, as uh, two of the principal investigators on those cooperative agreements. And the contracts are responsible for, for the program operations that you see on the slide. The next slide, please. In the daily course of our work, ARC staff and cooperative agreement holders hear routinely from stakeholders about what's important to them. When ARC awards cooperative agreements, we first issue a notice of funding opportunity or a, a NOFO. And in that NOFO, we suggest areas of interest for applicants to consider when they're responding. Applicants can address those areas or propose other areas for consideration. Uh, when um, in response to ARC's most recent NOFO for the CAPS program, the applicants specify their topics for survey development, uh, and revision as well as the other products and, and uh, research projects that they intend to pursue. And while the funds are, are committed for their proposed work, the CAPS program does have some flexibility built in for some smaller projects that might emerge as priority topics. Next slide, please. So here are some newly funded activities. This is not a comprehensive list of what we're, of all that we're doing, but this slide gives you an idea of the direction of our work. And I wanna point out to you that all of these activities had been identified by stakeholders as priority areas. So what we're doing now is uh, developing uh, surveys or items uh, or item sets on maternal care, inpatient mental health, perceptions of unfair treatment. We are updating the CAPS health plan and clinician and group surveys and the gender identity questions. We're evaluating ways to collect data that to increase survey response rates and the representativeness of the resulting data. We're updating our amb ambulatory care improvement guide, and we're focusing on how patient safety, employee engagement, and employee burnout relate to patient experience. And we're working on how to report patient narrative data with CAP survey data and understanding differences in reporting by population subgroups. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Ron. Okay, next slide. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. We really welcome, uh, and we are looking forward to your feedback. Um, next slide, please. So I have, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, stay on that first one. You you had already advanced the patient's voice. Yes, thank you. So ARC uh, funded a survey design project that was before CAPS, right before CAPS. And the conclusion of that project was that the patient perspective was central in the creation of state of the science um, surveys. So at the onset of CAPS, we recognized that it was essential that we hear from patients about what was important to them and ensure that survey respondents understood the questions they were asked. Next slide. So uh, when we create CAP surveys, this always involves multiple steps, reviewing the literature to build upon prior work, focus groups with English and Spanish language patients to identify the aspects of care that are important to them, uh, evaluating draft items to ensure that they are understood by target respondents, um, oversight by technical expert panels, translation of items into Spanish, and extensive field testing to ensure that the measures differentiate care from different providers. Next slide, please. Uh, so CAP surveys gather information from patients about aspects of care that are important to them and only include questions for which patients are the best source of information and ask them only about things that they have experienced. For example, we do not ask about technical quality of care because there are better sources of that information. Questions are tested to ensure they are understandable and feedback from stakeholders is used to update surveys to reflect the current healthcare landscape. Next slide, please. Uh, the development of the CAPS hospital survey is an example of the steps needed to finalize the survey. 
Before drafting HCAP survey items, we reviewed the existing hospital literature, then conducted 16 patient focus groups, put out a federal register call that yielded seven surveys, and obtained input in a public web chat and meetings with stakeholders. The draft items were cognitively tested with 31 patients, and then a field test was done with about 20,000 patients. CMS subsequently conducted a mode study. Next slide, please. Um, more recently, in preparation for the forthcoming HCAPS 2.0 survey, CMS funded additional patient focus groups and cognitive interviews and obtained input from a technical expert panel and the CAPS team. This was followed by 12 additional pa uh, patient cognitive interviews. Next slide. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about is uh, a, something that is very uh, useful for users, and that's the CAPS databases. They're right now available for health plans, home and community-based services, and child age gap surveys. And the main purpose of the databases is to facilitate comparisons of CAP survey results. So the data is voluntarily submitted by survey users who are then able to compare their results to aggregated data. Uh, the CAPS databases are also available for researchers. Next slide. Uh, so the public can use the ARC data tools to obtain selected CAPS survey summary information or download summary information from the annual chart books. Those who provide their data to the database receive private feedback reports that compare their patient experiences to the overall patient experience across the submitters. In addition, as I noted, researchers can ask for de-identified data to conduct research studies. Okay, now um, I'd like to turn it over to Susan to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. All right, thank you for inviting us to speak today. We've been really looking forward to this and are very excited about getting your input. So I'm trigger happy. Um, hang on just a second. I've got to get rid of something here. Oh, well. Can you? Thank you. I I don't think this is the right slide. I'm going backwards. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, so I'm not touching anything. <laughs> I'm here for your entertainment. Um, so I am going to be talking about how we get input from various stakeholders and people interested in using CAP surveys, both for measurement and improvement, and then some of the new work that we're doing to develop um, the surveys that I personally am incredibly excited about. So we have multiple partners. You've already heard about some of them, but um, many of the federal agencies, CMS, CMCS, the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, the National Cancer Institute, I promise I won't read all of these, have been using CAP surveys for decades um, regularly for measurement and improvement in many different settings. We also work with many different state initiatives. I've listed a couple of the larger ones that use CAP surveys, various CAP surveys, primarily the ambulatory CAP surveys. Um, and there are lots of uses of these in, in smaller regional initiatives. But just one example, the Massachusetts Health Quality Partnership 
has used both the hospital cap survey and the clinician group cap survey since the early 2000s. And they conduct an annual primary care survey that's funded by all the payers in Massachusetts. So every primary care practice with three or more patients or three or more clinicians gets their survey data annually. And that is used for pay for performance, it's used for improvement, and it's free to all of our primary care practices, which is especially important for practices that aren't affiliated with any of the larger health systems that routinely measure patient experience. Um, the California Purchaser Group on Health has actually been doing the same thing for decades. And again, I think one of the questions that came up in the last NAC meeting is, do we see improvement? Yes, we do see improvement. And we've seen massive improvement in the hospital caps data over the years. We also state Medicaid and the CHIP programs use CAP surveys. And then there are many advocacy organizations, patient and family-centered care advocacy organizations like the Barrel Institute, which is an international organization that has over 60,000 members um, that has a patient experience policy forum that is very focused on how we can use CAP surveys more effectively, how we can improve them, and also works with, with organizations like CMS around issues that, are real, that really matter um, both to patient and families, as well as people that lead patient experience improvement and measurement in healthcare organizations around the country and around the world. And we also work very closely with the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care um, that's based here in Washington. Um, we know that all the major patient experience vendors use CAP survey items. They're not always identified as a CAP survey item, but they are. Um, and they offer them in multiple modes of administration. So I know that there's been some discussion about the lag time with getting data. Some of the surveys like HCAPs that, that have to be really bulletproof in their administration because they're used for value-based purchasing, there is a lag time, but all the vendors offer that same survey and most of them give real-time data back to their clients. So in my universe at Mass General, our vendor pulls a sample for HCAPs that is submitted for the requirements to CMS, but every day we get HCAPs data back from people that could have been discharged the day before. We reach out to our patients 48 hours after their discharge by email. If they answer, it's wonderful. If they don't, they get a phone call um, using interactive voice recognition, and we get that data regularly along with comments that are incredibly valuable. Um, for patient safety, for improvement, and um, for monitoring what's going on with our staff. Oops. So we also have lots of other ways that we engage stakeholders and that we educate and that we work on quality improvement. So in terms of out outreach and collaboration, um, we used to have a CAPS user group meeting that we had annually that would attract um, depending on the year, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 people. And it was a combination of a lot of people from the organizations I just mentioned, as well as researchers, government agencies. And it was a wonderful gathering where we got lots of in-person feedback. And we were also able to do a lot of education. Um, unfortunately, the government sort of stopped all big meetings like that. And so we shifted to other ways of doing outreach that I'll talk about in a minute. But in terms of other groups that we collaborate with and talk with regularly, um, we meet regularly with the National Quality Forum's new alignment collaborative that is a group of health plans and healthcare organizations that are really focusing on making sure that we measure what matters to people. Um, and they're trying to address sort of the measurement tower of Babel and look at what are really meaningful data that we need for safety, patient experience, <laughs> clinical quality improvement. Um, we've, we are working with OECD 
Um, they have developed a patient safety survey that is being used in other countries that we're looking at and considering how some of those items might be incorporated into CAPS. Um, I actually participated in an international seminar on patient safety measurement with Nick Klazinga, who was leading the OECD measurement at the time. So we're very interested in what we're going to learn from that and also working with patients for Patient Safety US, which Krista is involved with. We discussion and um, have conversations with our colleagues at CMS in lots of the different centers in CMS also to get their input. Again, I mentioned the Barrel Institute Patient Experience Policy Forum, and that is a very, um, I love this group, I'm a part of it, but it is a combination of chief experience officers, quality improvement experts from healthcare systems and organizations that cover the waterfront of care in the U.S., and also all their patient and family advisors. So we get the patient voice as well as the voices of people that are working with the data. Um, we also are having conversations with the Partnership for Quality Measurement that is led by Battelle and IHI and the CAPS investigators have met with them to talk about how they're going to be approaching the evaluation of measures going forward. They took this role over from the National Quality Forum, and we've had um, a good set of beginning conversations with them about that. Um, we also work with the Institute for Healthcare Improvements Health System Leadership Alliance, which is an international group of health systems. They have about 55 health systems. And I actually just met with them last week um, to hear about what's important to them in terms of how we measure and improve the patient's experience. Um, we also have just had a meeting with the ACGME about how patient experience measures can be used in residency programs. There, you know, there's a lot of concern about giving this kind of feedback to residents because people are worried that it will be distressing to them. I look at all of our primary care data at Mass General, not daily, but almost daily, and I can see all the resident data, and by and large, it's incredibly positive. And so I think that the, and we think it's very important for residents to get experience with these data, because when they're in practice, they're going to be getting these data all the time, and understanding how to use them, how to accept and sort of learn from any comments or feedback that might not be so positive, we think is a very important part of professionalism. And then finally, we have stakeholder expert panels that advise us on all the, the new survey development. So examples of stakeholder expert panels, um, we've had a mental health stakeholder expert panel that had a combination of people from some of the largest patient mental health organizations in the country. It also had lots of mental health clinicians on it that have advised us on our new mental health survey that's been tested um, and is, is now available. We are just um, beginning the work to develop um, maternity childbirth surveys that will focus on prenatal care, inpatient maternity care, and postpartum care. And we are convening a set of stakeholders in January in person um, that include people from many of the um, birth equity groups around the country, national OBGYN leaders, certified nurse midwives, doulas, um, lots of uh, people that are very concerned about the state of maternity care in the US. Um, and I'm gonna be leading that work and I have to tell you, Personally, I think it's going to be one of the most meaningful things I do in my work with CAPS over the years. Um, and we also are working on improving the CAPS Ambulatory Improvement Guide, and we're updating the clinician and group health and health plan surveys. Um, and, and so we also, be in, in lieu of the CAPS user group meeting that I mentioned, we shifted to doing annual research meetings, and we do these based on the kinds of input that we're getting from people about what they want to learn more about, what they're confused about, what they're concerned about. And so I've just listed a few here. Um, our most recent one um, was keynoted by Don Berwick and talked about the relationship between patient experience measures, patient safety, and provider well-being, which is incredibly important. Um, one, just a quick anecdote from 
from that? One of um, my colleagues on the Yale Harvard team that leads our quality improvement work <laughs> and who's working very closely with our the team that works on our narrative items um, talked about a study that she did at Columbia Presbyterian where they fed data back to all of the clinicians in 22 of Columbia Presbyterian's ambulatory practices and they shared their survey data and their comments. Half of the practices got the comments and the survey data, half, half did not. And what they found, and they also looked at burnout at the beginning of this study, pretty much everyone across the board, clinicians and non-clinicians were at about a 40% burnout rate, which I think is pretty standard in primary care right now, if not kind of good. Um, and what they found at the end of the study is that the people that got their survey data and their comments, their burnout rates dropped to 8%. And there was no other intervention addressing burnout in these practices at the time. So these are just some examples of the kinds of research meetings that we have. And all of the summaries of the research meetings and any articles that are produced about them are available on the ARC website. And then we also do, oh, I'm pushing the wrong button, sorry. We also do webcast and we, we've done these for years. They also, are, all the recordings are available on the ARC website. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can see that we cover a lot of different topics. And again, the topics that we choose are driven by the kinds of questions. We have a, a sort of a CAPS, email address that people send in lots of questions, comments, requests, and whatever. And we pay very close attention to that to determine what we should be focusing on in these webcasts. I just wanted to share a little bit about our quality improvement studies. So these are being led um, by myself and others from the Yale Harvard team and also from RAND. Um, and we're looking at the what happens when you have patients seeing providers that speak their same language versus when they don't. Um, and how that affects their experience of care in FQHCs. We're also looking again at the relationship between quality improvement, patient experience, employee culture and employee burnout. Um, my team is looking at the use of, we've developed a new set of patient engagement items for the clinician group CAP survey. And we're using those in a community practice that is very diverse with patients that all have multiple chronic conditions. And we're looking to see um, how feeding that data back along with information and communication training around shared decision-making improves the scores on those surveys. And then the CAPS Improvement Guide. So this is something that um, I authored with some of my colleagues on the um, Yale team, and then we added people from RAND um, when we started updating it. It's actually been one of the most popular things on the ARC website, and it focuses on ambulatory care improvement. And we are in the process of updating it again. And it looks at all the different things that you need to have in place to cultivate and improve patient and family-centered care. It gives input about how do you analyze survey data. And frankly, this is an improvement guide that people use for lots of reasons, even if they're not using CAPS surveys for improvement, because all of the improvement strategies are effective with any kind of patient experience survey. And then we include all of the things that we know as much as possible are evidence-based improvement strategies for all of the different components of the survey. So improving access, improving communication, and we're in the process of updating it. We've conducted um, literally hours. Most of these interviews were about two hours with 25 different users and improvement experts from around the country. We're gonna be adding new content about um, maternal health, patient safety, mental health, and some of the other areas that we're focusing on now that are newer in the CAPS universe. So I think that's the um, end of my time. Thank you. Okay, th uh, thanks to the team on um, giving us uh, this great overview 
on on caps and and um, you know a deep dive into some of the some of the kind of the power of of the of that approach. Um, so what we'll do here is again what we're going to leverage. And I see the hands raised. And we're going to leverage the um, the the pre work time. I'm going to call on uh, uh, breakout group four um, Elizabeth Moore to uh, help us um, uh, with uh, some of the some of the learnings from uh, the discussion uh, in the breakout groups, and then we'll start to pull in the other the other comments from the other breakout groups as well. But let's start with Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yeah, so we had some specific questions that we were asked to review. And first of all, before I get into that, um, that presentation, those presentations were incredibly helpful and building on what we learned in the July session um, really was a great deep dive into the history, um, the current state and potential future state of the incredible work um, that has been done on these surveys. Um, one of the questions we were asked is whether or not any of us in the discussion group had ever accessed the guide for ambulatory um, improvement that you mentioned, Susan. Um, and before I answer that question, I thought it was an, an unfortunately a bad question to start with, uh, because had, that, had there been another question like, how strongly do you support incredible um, work going forward necessary to really leverage what our, our patients can tell us. That would have been a different discussion, but I do wanna say it's important to share what we learned to the answer to that question. And unfortunately, none of us in our discussion group had ever gone in and accessed that report on our website. But I know for a fact, since Susan and I work in the same organization, that people in my organization, Mass General Hospital, um, had accessed it. So I'm not sure the response from our pre-work um, is particularly helpful because the next um, discussion points that we hit, hit were really endorsing how incredibly supportive everybody in our group was about the importance of getting patients' views, not just on what we get patient views on now, but on other things. So the discussion then sort of exploded uh, providing incredible endorsement of the work. Um, and then what ensued, I would say, is moving from traditional patient experience measures that we're all familiar with to getting input through surveys and other means on patients' experience of safety, diagnostic error, their concerns about coordination of care, their concerns about over-testing, their concerns about lots of things that we all know are very, very important to patients and the overall quality of care. So a quick and immediate, uh, very exciting dialogue ensued that really talked about what we can be doing to build on the strengths of what already exists, not just in terms of content, but also venues um, and what part of the ecosystem really needed some more attention. And um, although the ambulatory work is, is well established, I think I would say we need more of it um, because that's so much where the action is right now. So stronger use of the tools, um, not just the measures, but these resource tools. I'm really glad that it's being updated uh, team. That's great. Uh, so ambulatory for sure. And in addition to that, some of the non-acute areas that maybe need some more help there. Um, and home-based care. That part of the ecosystem and healthcare delivery is exploding. Hospital at home, infusion centers, all sorts of things. Wherever patients get care, we need to get those surveys in a practical way out into those venues to really understand what not the experience is and to start to get more information on safety, equity, bias, all of these other important aspects. I would also say that if we're measuring patients' experience when they get care, we're not measuring one of the biggest national problems in general, which is foundational, which is access. So we're only getting the patient's point of view when they actually get to care. And all of us know that access in today's world is an incredibly big problem. So how do we get at that? That was a, an ask. Um, tools to help. Um, we do believe that AI, one of our AI experts was in the room, AI has promised to fill some of the gaps that exist today, uh, 
uh, providers, caregivers using electronic health records, trying to see as many patients as they can, um, arguably will benefit from tools that AI can generate in terms of general communication, communication about topics that providers just simply may not have time to go through in the depth that patients need. Um, and also we all acknowledge that uh, the data show that when AI generated messages are delivered, they often are, not always, but often are more compassionate than the way that providers might write or have the time to write. Um, so I think what I would say in summary is that there was incredible enthusiasm for leveraging what we can, information from patients. Uh, to your point, Susan, getting it in real time is very, very important. Real time so you could do immediate service recovery or reach out and do some corrections. Uh, people really valued that. Um, using the data, not just to look at what we would think of traditionally, but and importantly as your basic experience measures, but really beginning to understand what's missing and what patients view as problems in the safety realm, equity realm, um, and other areas of quality. Um, I would say we didn't talk about proms as much, um, but we did talk a lot about patient experience. And uh, I think I'll close there. Um, incredible work historically in the CAPS team um, and setting a foundation that we're grateful that we have. And yet we acknowledge that there is so much more work to be done. Go for it, Susan. I want to just make one comment about what you mentioned about diagnostic error, mm -hmm. because what we see, and I, we didn't mention this in our presentation, but the group that's working on the comments part, the, the feedback, the narrative items, is very focused on how they can be used to identify diagnostic error. And I know from my day job at Mass General, I our vendor analyzes all of the comments we get using natural language processing and anything that has language in it that signals something may not have gone well or right gets flagged. And I read those, they're called service alerts. Almost all of the alerts that are about a particular clinician are really about something related to diagnostic error. And we use those in our division. I'm in the division of general internal medicine our leadership, we use those to identify our clinicians that and that need coaching, that need help, and that need support. And it's it's really fascinating to me because we have had, although we don't have as many now, about 350 primary care clinicians. We only get those alerts about about a handful but it's the same handful, so you know they need help. And it's very important because those issues would not necessarily show up in just a standard survey item, but they really show up in the comments. So we think the comments of the surveys and um, the survey data and comments is very valuable for safety as well. But that's a so um, can I just say one other comment um, that the issue of access to care, at least in the health plan survey, if they're in a health plan, we do ask them about that. So that was the first survey developed. So there is information about access issues for people who are enrolled in a plan. But of course, if you're not insured, that's, a, that's another matter. So I'm going to ask a provocative question for the team. Um, I mean, survey is literally in the name, but is survey the the best and only tool we should use to get the information we're trying to gather around patient experience? Or are there other ways and have we started to um, really leverage other ways of, of, of understanding a patient's experience of care? Can I respond? My response to that is that um, I've been working on the improvement side of this for decades, and I get asked all the time, so we got our survey back. We're not wild about the data. We want to do another survey. And I'm like, that's the last thing you want to do. Um, you're only going to get the same information again. 
So you need to go directly to the people that are giving you feedback that you're not happy with and interview them, do focus groups, get more qualitative feedback, and also go to your patient and family partners. You know, in Massachusetts, we're lucky enough that we have a state law that requires every hospital to have patient family advisory groups. So at Mass General alone, we have over 150 patient advisors that we go to to talk to because you need that rich, detailed information to understand not only why you got the results you did on the survey, but how to fix it. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so on the other side of uh, the issue, um, I think sometimes, and a lot of places do this, they'll do shorter surveys because I think one issue that people have been concerned with, obviously, is representativeness and response rates. And if you have at least one question, you know, to get some information from a lot more people, that can be very helpful as well. So uh, let's uh, continue the discussion. What I'd like to do um, is, uh, is is flip it a little bit. So what happens often when you have a when you have a, a hybrid meeting is the folks who are remote are like are like last on the list. So I'm going to flip it. And so the folks who are, I think it was group one that was the remote group. Um, anyone from that group um, want to um, want to add here? Um, being again being additive. So if any of the any of the um, feedback and comments that came from uh, from uh, group four. Um, if there's anything that you want to add that was not covered, uh, please jump in. So um, I see Cincy's hand up, and, I, and I'm pretty sure you were remote, so you can you can go first. Yeah, you're pretty sure, I guess. Um, you know, the beach in the back uh, probably <laughs> indicates that. Um, I, I just wanted to answer the provocative question about how to get um, information that's important for all of these purposes, and um, especially doubling down what Susan just said about um making sure that you have multiple avenues for people to provide as patients and their families to be able to provide um information for you right um and so the surveys one um we absolutely uh endorse the importance of patient and family uh councils um and and then also like just other ways, right? Like I can tell you from personal experience that um, when there have been issues, when I've been hospitalized, for example, you know, the head of nursing will come and try to um, help solve it. Honestly, I have to say something just seems like a PR situation where they're trying to make me not too mad. Um, but there are, there are other, you know, avenues kind of like internal where you can get some of the more qualitative, like what exactly went wrong behind the outcome that the survey um, finds, right? Um, so finding ways to do that, um, having multiple ways in multiple languages um, is gonna be really, I think really, really important. And I also wanted to just re re um, reinforce what Mireille, uh, I can't pronounce that name, I'm sorry. I'm not really good with French. Um, Marie, I think it is, um, said before she, she had to leave about needing, um, we need to do a much better job, not only of making sure that we are getting, you know, representative um, data, um, but it's not enough to just get it. You have to actually stratify your results by groups. And, that, and, and from the health equity perspective, that is the only way to really know um, what your situation is with equity and um, whether you're making any progress. Thank, thank you for that. That's uh, that's great. And so part of part of um, and I'm glad you pulled in Mireille's um, uh, comments as well. I think that's great to capture uh, around the representativeness, and it was seconded in the com in the chat as in the chat as well. Um, yeah. So on those different channels, let's call them, or ways to gather that information, as Cynthia had talked about. Well, I think what I'd, I'd like to understand, you know, because there's there's so much rigor, you guys put so much in, um, attention around the surveys, right? And there's and they're high stakes, uh, as mentioned, right? There's there's lots of different um, uses for it and, and so forth as well. But um, can we put time and rigor and attention into these other channels mm -hmm. as well, so that we we really start to have a more um, representative kind of um, a look, uh, a well-rounded look at, at at patient experience in a way that's rigorous, um, in a way that's where the data can be believed, 
um, and where um, it's it's actionable um, and even reproducible in some ways. Can I make another quick comment? Um, in the ambulatory improvement guide, we actually have a whole section on all the different qualitative methods, including journey mapping, walkthroughs, um, lots of different ways to get the perspective of patients and families and staff that can be used for improvement. And we look at who looks at what in the guide, and that's one of the most popular areas. But I also think that one of the issues that we're struggling with and I see this in, I do a lot of work in patient safety as well, is that we give people a lot of data, we give them a lot of recommendations about what needs to be improved, but we don't tell them how to do it. And I think that is where people are drowning in data, but we really need to focus on how do you actually use it to improve? And I think that's an area that I would love for us to be able to dig more deeply in. That's a really, really good point. I, and I, I would take that a step further. So yes, how do you actually improve? Then I would go back and say, hey, did you use that improvement method? Okay, how did it work for you? Right. And then use that as a, as a continuous uh, feedback loop on, on, the, um, on the interventions that are appropriate. Let's, let's get to the, the, the questions that are from the folks in the room. I think, Joan, I saw you first. Thank you. So my question is whether um, you think the ambulatory care improvement guide is informing the databases that the vendors are sharing with customers in order to improve um, patient experience. Because though I wasn't familiar with this guide, I know that, you know, whether it's NRC or Prescani or whoever, they have evidence-based databases for systems to use. So I was wondering if there's a connection. Yes, I think that many of them use them. And I think um, one thing I didn't mention is that for lots of different reasons early on when HCAPS was introduced, um, we, we actually couldn't do an improvement guide for HCAPS, but in my private world, we did. And a lot of those um, guides are all part, if you go on any of the vendors sort of improvement resources, which they don't really focus on a lot, but they're there. It's a lot of the same material that's in the guide or it is the guide. Because one thing I didn't mention is that every single thing we do in CAPS is in the public domain. So anyone can use it, including the vendors. That's great. Um, Amy. Oops. Hi, Amy Tobin. There we go. There you go. You're good. Not anymore. Did it once. You're good. You, go. okay. you have it? Mm -hmm. Great. I can hear myself. Good. Amy Kilborn from VA's Health Services Research Program and Quality Enhancement Research Initiative. Um, Susan, I loved how you brought up the need to um, show people how to improve quality, how to implement. And I want to also t um, talk about a thread you mentioned about evidence-based improvement and the opportunities there. And you asked about where's, where's the new research or what the future research directions are looking like. My sense is I would strongly encourage a marriage with the concepts of implementation science and the work you're doing because implementation science is trying to really unpack what makes quality improvement work generalized in a generalizable way and how could it move the needle on H caps and caps outcomes. And so, you know, thinking about HRQ and the funding mechanisms, is there an opportunity to maybe um, devote to innovative research on really ways in which we can use implementation science and implementation strategies to basically figure out for frontline providers to figure out how to actually sustain those improvements and make those improvements work in, in different areas. Well, that's music to our ears, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amy. Uh, David, you're Thank you for your presentation and just a couple of one comment and two brief questions related to the material presented. Uh, I just really want to endorse uh, engaging ACGME as a medical educator. I think it's incredibly important for uh, those uh, becoming more familiar with healthcare delivery to be able to experience feedback and know how to utilize it. So thank you for that. Regarding maternity care, I, I agree that it's just a critically important issue right now, not only with regard to access, but also quality. I heard you mention OBGYN physicians or certified nurse midwives. I didn't hear family physicians mentioned. 
And I wanted to ask if you're engaging family physicians, given the fact that they deliver care, maternity care, including deliveries, especially in some of our most resource limited environments. Yeah, we actually have several family physicians that are on the stakeholder expert panel um, from University of Chicago, from University of North Carolina, um, because it's critical. And I think I mentioned doulas. We have people from rural areas, Native American um, clinicians and patient representatives. Um, so, but we definitely have family medicine and family medicine has been very involved in a lot of the reproductive justice work as well. Appreciate that. And my last question may, may be from one of the uh, response from the other panelists, but advancing equity uh, in rural America, thinking about how age caps are voluntary, as I understand it, by CMS for critical access hospitals, but that some do participate. I'm interested in seeing how that data might be integrated or incorporated for those that do participate. Um, an example I would have is that the pandemic really exposed workforce shortages, for example, uh, and the ability of uh, hospitals to safely transfer to a higher level of care or more spec specified level of care. And so my question is, uh, as we persist in particular with nursing workforce shortages, mm. I'm still seeing this happening where patients may or may not be able to tra be transferred safely to a higher, more specific level of care. And that is certainly part of the patient's experience I'd like to see measured uh, and, and acted upon. Could I answer that question? Uh, go ahead. Could I res I'd like yeah. to respond to the last comment. And I think that that is a, a really important issue. I've in fact talked to HRSA about how to uh, involve critical access hospitals uh, more substantially those uh, in the CAPS process. I know they've been interested. Uh, those conversations were several years ago. And again, their concerns are that, that you know, um, if they are involved in the, in the CAPS process through CMS, that's where data go and it goes into that data stream or whatever. But I do appreciate that comment. And uh, as we don't receive data from HCAPS uh, and HRSA does have a, its own process for whatever they use. I can only say that um, if there is an opportunity to help analyze those data, we would be very happy to do that. Um, before we go to Jadrika, let, let me, uh, I want to pull in a couple of comments from the chat because um, not everyone necessarily can see that. I know we can see it, but I want to pull a couple of those. And so one of them um, included uh, the idea of, of a non-survey method to collect uh, patient experience um, uh, using a rigorous, rigorously analyzing actually social media um, and kind of, a, you know, kind of leveraging that approach uh, as well. Um, another another comment to pull in. This is from the the team, uh, the group one team that was um, um, uh, the remote team. Is uh, a couple of things. One is. One, one's, a, one's a question, which is how many of these, uh, the questions in the surveys target leading versus lagging indicators, it's one. And then second is, um, you know, standardization, and the question of standardization is good. However, sometimes there's uh, personalization within an institution might be, might be helpful. So how, how do you balance the standardization versus uh, personalization um, uh, when it comes to the uh, opportunities to implement um, changes based on based on these things, these but just just for the last thing, uh, of course there are supplemental items, and people can add targeted items to help with what they're most interested in. That's not in the standard survey, so there is that opportunity. But of course. Uh, you know, if you add too many of them, it can be problematic for the response rate. Any thoughts from on leading versus lagging? I'm not sure if I understand that question. So the the, the question, I think I am going to try to interpret, or we can just have, I think, can I just jump on if you, yeah. Can I just jump on and ask yourself as opposed to me reinterpreting? I appreciate it, Edmundo. I think uh, the, uh, the, that was based on the fact that most of the time the questions are, I think, the way it's being phrased is targeting what's happened within a certain, uh, uh, what's happened rather than what do you feel could potentially happen as a way to predict what needs to be done moving forward from an intervention point of view. So that, that's where I was coming up with the lagging versus uh, leading indicator of what 
the survey questions might be leading us to consider whether it's something that's happened versus something that's going to happen. Because if it's the latter, then you could potentially prevent it from happening before it happens. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I'm still not sure I fully understand how you would ask those other questions. Um, you know, mostly what CAPS focuses on is experiences over some recent period of time. So I don't think we're capturing as much as the latter as you would like, but I'd like to hear more about it in the future. Yeah, we do. I mean, we we ask the questions that ask people, did something happen or not? But we also have an overall rating item that allows us to analyze the data so that we know which of the components of the survey are the ones that are most important to patients that will drive a higher rating on the overall rating. So we know, for example, with HCAPS, the nursing care is actually critical. The um, nurse communication and responsiveness of staff, if you don't do well on those, you are not going to get a good rating. Um, so that may be in part a part of an answer to your question. Yeah, I think that's the concept. But again, the concept of leading versus lagging, right? So that's a that's kind of so it's it's the, this idea that you're asking a question that's going to help you understand what a future outcome is going to be. Right. So, you know, so in, in, the, in the example that you use, Susan, like, you know, if you're asking about, you know, nursing, let's call it nursing engagement, broadly yeah. speaking, that's going to help you understand your your future quality scores or outcomes um, right. at some point at some point before. So if you're if you're understanding that nursing engagement is dropping, if you intervene, you might be able to actually affect right. your, your quality outcome at the end. That's a leading indicator yeah. as opposed to measuring the quality that, that happened already. Yeah, that's a lagging indicator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think just one quick comment. We know that if people don't do well on nursing communication, just from our quality improvement work, that's often a signal that you've got a serious culture issue between the nurses and the doctors, which may be getting at what you're talking about. Because if they can't answer questions, they're not getting the information they need from the clinic, the physicians. And they're maybe nervous about asking them. They may not feel safe asking for the kind of help they need with the patients. No, that that's that's great. I think it's a great example. And I think part of the benefit of the of the leading indicators is it gives you a little bit more proximal intervention opportunity. Um, uh, so I think that so it's, it's a great call out to them. Um, Dejika, yeah. So one quick thing is that there has been some work in CMS to look at what is related to the overall rating and how it varies by race, ethnicity, and other characteristics. So I think that's a refinement of the overall idea that Susan just mentioned, because it can vary depending on the characteristics of the patients. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Really enjoyed it, Susan. Um, I had two comments that were just my comments, and then um, I also could share from our group three and just say that most of the things that Liz said, I felt like she's reading from our, our notes, honestly. Um, but I'll just say, highlight something um, that she said. But I wanted to make a comment on um, uh, the patient, the prenatal care in um, inpatient postpartum like the group, the work group that, that you're talking about. And I agree with David related to including family physicians. So glad to hear that that's a part of it. I was wondering if there's any thought considered to actually going to the preconception health piece, because we know that much about what happens through the continuum of, you know, maternity wellness and maternal child health is related to the health of the mom before pregnancy. So I wonder if that, if there's any consideration to including that as a part of that. There hasn't been to date. Mm -hmm. um, we're just actually, to be quite honest, thrilled to have enough funding to do prenatal, inpatient, and postpartum. But I'm sure that's going to come up um, in the stakeholder expert panel discussions, um, because I also think that that's really critical in terms of what we're trying to do to improve maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, so we're just really happy we can at least focus on prenatal care. So, but that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. I think also, and I suspect it'll come up is like the integration of uh, mental health with this. It's, I mean, the integration with 
mental health with everything is really coming up, especially around opiates and opioid use and just people being prepared to even take care of women that are dealing with those issues. Yeah, we did a um, request for information in the federal register and we got 25 responses, but most of those responses were from organizations and entities that represent thousands of people and mental health showed up there big time, which is critical. Yeah. For wanted, the maternity work. Yes, yes, yes. I also wanted to comment on the paper that you um, reported out on related to burnout and how sharing comments makes a big difference. And I think that that's huge and a great opportunity for us because so many times uh, physicians getting or healthcare providers just getting um, the survey results is quite depressing, mm -hmm. feeds into burnout and it's, you know, vicious cycle. So being able to find studies that are showing that um, the comments are making a difference is huge, especially uh, reducing it to 8% is amazing. And I was going to add that, you know, there's been a lot of studies recently about, you know, people leaving academic medicine, women leaving academic medicine more than men, seeing the differences by race, ethnicity, or gender related to burnout. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's more research that needs to be done in that in that space. I don't think we have enough information about underrepresented folks in medicine, nor women in medicine actually as it relates to burnout. Can I respond to that? Yes. <laughs> um, just quickly, that's something that we've been very interested in looking at. Part of the problem is that a lot of organizations don't, we can't access the race, gender, ethnicity of the clinicians to pair it up with the yeah. patient so that we can do those kinds of analyses. Gotcha. But it's something that we would love to do. I'd like to just add that in the other program that I direct the surveys on patient safety culture, we've been recently uh, adding supplemental items to the our SOP surveys on safety culture that address workplace safety or questions about the safe environment as well as burnout and job satisfaction. And one of the, um, and so these are surveys of employees about the extent to which their facility has a, uh, their facility's culture leads to a safe patient environment. So these workforce safety questions are additional questions. And one of the uh, priorities that we funded had to do with evaluating CAP surveys on patient experience with SOP surveys on safety culture. So we are addressing those issues and looking at that relationship. That's great. That was actually one of our, our uh, recommendations yeah. from the, one of the later questions. Well, right now we have supplemental items for the hospital survey on patient safety culture and the nursing home survey on patient safety culture. And we're in the middle of developing uh, another item set on uh, workplace safety for medical offices. So stay tuned and we'll have lots of announcements and publicity about that when that's ready to go. That's awesome. Well, I'll be quiet because I feel like the other items were kind of already addressed a bit. I was going to highlight them, but um, yeah, for the sake of time. No, no, this is an advisory council. There's no quiet. The only, uh, thing, <laughs> actually, the only thing I will comment on is the community engagement piece, which is we, we really talked a lot about the people not getting the experience. And I know we already said that. But it's nice to know with the ambulatory care guide, there are some strategies for engaging people that are not going to the traditional places that are not getting care except for the emergency departments and things like that. So cool. All right. Uh, we have a few minutes left in this in this topic um, and we have a few hands raised. So uh, let's uh, make it crisp. Kathy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You are on. So um, just a couple of things. Um, You're not on. Kathy, you not press on. your button. Is it not working? It's not working. All right, this one is working though. Yeah. So just a couple of things to piggyback uh, with with what Jadrika was saying um, related to um, maternal health care and surveys. Um, I saw a slide that showed development of new surveys related to maternal health care, but also then perception of unfair treatment. I think this is probably gonna come up in your expert panel, but there's probably gonna be a significant need to combine those. And that may be for other areas other than, uh, than maternal health care. Uh, related to the um, impact that nursing care has on overall experience, and David's point about it's a great idea to partner with ACGME, probably also a great idea to partner with the American Association of Colleges of Nursing and other places where nursing is, uh, where nursing education happens. 
particularly given the fact that the nursing licensing exam is now going more to a context case-based exam that could really marry some of these very important concepts of communication and patient experience um, in its um, testing that could facilitate later on. Um, wonder also about when um, the CAPS program wants to consider other cultures and languages other than just English and Spanish, given, I, yeah, and, I, and I, I just wanna call that out. And even folks who may be proficient in English, perhaps the wording of the question makes it less likely that they will answer or want to answer appropriately. So just, um, just thinking there as well. Could I respond to some of the points you made? Um, uh, first, the, the recent notice of funding opportunity did call out specifically not just perceived bias and unfair treatment, but respectful care as well, which is of huge concern in the maternal health community. So we know that those issues will, are going to be in the forefront. And you know we agree with you about the translation issues, you, you, uh, the, the uh, readability of surveys as well as the availability of surveys in um, other languages. Now CMS translates it, the surveys that it administers and we'll be putting links to those translations on our website. We don't have them quite yet, but we'll be putting links to translated versions of the surveys that CMS administers. So those will be available. Um, uh, and uh, all I can say from the ARC perspective is that we're, we're working on how to address those issues. It's of concern to us too. So I just want you to know that this concern is heard and, and it's being discussed. Neil. Yeah. Well, the unfair treatment thing, CMS has already administered some items in the ambulatory setting, and we're adopting some of that in the RAND work where we're looking at care at FHQP, Federal Qualified Health Centers. In the interest of time, I'll change my question to a comment. Uh, I represent a large purchaser group, and I learned three things. First of all, as Liz said, nobody in our group this morning was aware there even was an ambulatory care improvement guide. I learned today that there are CAPS databases that are available, and that one of my sister coalitions out in St. Louis has been using CAPS for years. So my comment is, uh, I think there's an opportunity for ARC to do a much better job of dissemination of information on CAPS, particularly to the non-provider audience, to let consumers and purchasers know what's there, what's been done, what the opportunities are there for them to use these tools or to use the data that's been derived from these tools. Thank you, that's really helpful. And um, we'll find ways to do some better marketing to those groups. We are in connections. Yeah, we'd love to, thank you. Caroline. Thanks for the presentation today. Re wearing my health plan um, hat today, I had a couple of questions about in the original intention of the CAPS to measure health plan quality. Many of us would say that so much of the focus of the CAPS survey is on the experience at the provider level or in the system level, not actually at or with the health plan. That has that really changed the experience with health plans overall. Um, so that's just one question for you all. And another comment about in the spirit of partnerships with other groups, I'm wondering in the health plan survey, have you participated with AHIP or the Blues Association or Medicaid Health Plans of America or the Association of Community-Based Health Plans? Any of those groups to help uh, try to work the survey in such a way that it is reflecting what the health plans are doing short of a call center. And I, we, for the health plan survey, which was our original survey, um, because it was back in the era of managed care and people were very concerned about giving people data that they could use to help choose a plan. We do ask items. We've partnered very closely with NCQA for years. 
on the health plan survey in the updates of the health plan survey. And it does ask questions about the plan services in addition to the person's experience with, you know, wherever they're getting their care. But I think your ideas about other entities that are related to health plans is very important and a very important audience. Back to Liz. Yeah, I'll did what I'll do what Neil did, which is make two comments with no questions <laughs> to, to get through this. One comment is on on the impact of individual provider feedback on the provider. When we first launched in our organization, data back to the individual provider about how they did. Um, some were delighted, but those that weren't delighted were really impacted by it. We did three things to promote the growth mindset. Number one was we no longer send out the information on weekends. Number two, we allowed people a number to call to discuss the, the comments. And there was a vetting process actually to have comments removed. Um, and then I, and the third was really uh, to promote growth mindset attitudes about learning from the feedback uh, because it is an opportunity for improvement. And I think people are now moving through that phase and really seeing these things as relatively positive. And when they're negative comments, well, by gosh, we got to learn from them. The other comment is really think about, the team should think about, in my opinion, how we can uh, get on the sort of incentive bandwagon a little bit more fully than we are now when it comes to patient experience incentives. Right now, HCAPS is on just about everything. What other kinds of measures uh, can the team come up with that could be on the table for pay for performance and high stakes um, activities that would get a seat at the table on the top things that institutions are actually able to do and afford. There's so much opportunity and yet people are strapped for improvement resources and there's lots of targets. So just something to think about. Thanks Liz. Um, we are, we are into our lunch period, but I'm going to get, come along um, to, for the last comment uh, on this topic. Thank you for this important discussion. I'm I'm really excited to see the emphasis on maternal care and health inequities. I just wanted to make um, sort of a comment about now that patients have more access to their EHRs and their own records, how can we harness that capability to promote sort of better care experience as well as diagnostic excellence? It seems to me that's a way to sort of look at care across the continuum rather than a singular episode. Uh, and it really gives patients sort of the driver's seat. Yeah, yes. I don't want to be between you all and lunch. You are, you um, are. <laughs> that, I think that is a really important comment. And one thing I'll share is that my colleagues in the original work that I was involved in with Paul Cleary before CAPS um, through the Picker Institute, they are the people that created open notes. And I think it, they are a very valuable and important research, research arm to address all the issues you brought up. And I think one of the things that people do when they see their records that most often happens is they correct all the errors. Mm -hmm. in, in their data, their family history, their medications. Um, you know, I personally have prevented two serious safety events for myself because I was able to see what was going on in my record and I knew it was wrong. And I had a great doctor, but it was all about the, the lapse between what happens when you're an inpatient and you go home and the, the, the providers don't have, the outpatient and the inpatient people don't talk. So I think it's really important what you just said. Outstanding uh, presentation and conversation. Thank you all for your engagement and for this 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 work around. I think I think we learned a lot, and hopefully you all um, took something back from the from the comments from the uh, team. Yes. I just want to play questions so as we think about for the rest of the day, and as you interact with each other and interact with me. Help me understand. At the at fundamentally at this discussion raised the issue of the relationship between three parties that are engaged in this patient experience work us uh, supporting the developers of the surveys and and the other measures uh, and potentially the uh, the advice for how to improve um, the sponsors whether they see having to be cms or an insurer or a health plan or a, a health system 
and the vendors who actually implement uh, these surveys. What can, what are the issues that ARC in, in our capacity should be addressing with regard to these relationships between these three parties? Where can we help the end product, which is the product of all three of these groups interacting, get better? Jim. Thanks. I see the role as convener um, for that because, well, for a hundred reasons that I won't elaborate over time, but I think our role would be great to be a convener. Any other thoughts? Since he jump in. Yeah, I think also to help, you know, be a priority setter and a gap identifier, right? Um, I think that, especially in the context of all the things that are that that the industry and all the participants in it are trying to all do at the same time, um, that there is because of the position uh, your positionality and opportunity to help set priorities and elevate certain issues that may not um, be getting elevated, that need to be elevated. Liz. And I, I would just say, um, apropos my comment that um, the healthcare delivery systems are struggling to prioritize improvement efforts and arguably um, many of them look to incentive programs um, as a way to help prioritize. So, ARC could uh, play a big role as it is doing uh, to align with those that design those incentive programs to make sure that we're asking uh, health systems to prioritize the things that are most important to patient care. Mm -hmm. HCAPs is a good start, but um, a lot of what's going on right now requires looking at different parts of the healthcare delivery system and probably different kinds of metrics. So really pushing for more room at the table in the incentive world so that we can elevate the importance of this work on patient experience as boards and CEOs of these big healthcare systems start to prioritize where they put the improvement resources, which are scarce. Patricia. Very similar comment to Liz's, but just like with a different, um, just a different wording, I guess. Um, but I think as just serving as a guidepost, um, with the health equity lens in particular, because I think when a voice, a strong voice um, kind of sets that tone and says, this is how we should look at it. And I know people question like, what exactly is the health equity lens? But we do have some guidelines around what health, a health equity lens is. So I think by using that, I think that can influence policy and ultimately change. That's a key Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, very much. Uh, this concludes this, this section of the agenda. Um, we yes, I will get to that as well. I'm on it. I'm on it. All right. So we, <laughs> we have uh, 38 minutes for lunch. Um, and uh, we'll return at 115 sharp um, during their lunch period. Uh, we will uh, take photos outside, a group photo outside. And again, all those who are um, uh, closing out their, their time on the NAC uh, this month will be taking individual photos as well. Okay, thank you all. 115. Uh, move. We move the agenda item uh, to the agenda item on uh, a report out of our of our, one of our snacks. So, the subcommittee and national advisory council. This snack was on the national action alliance to advance patient safety. Um, so, uh, with that and that report out, I want to uh, go ahead and hand it over to uh, Lucy Savitz. Lucy is the uh, professor of health policy at uh, University of Pittsburgh and senior advisor to the UPMC Health Plan Services. Uh, Lucy served as the chair of this snack. Um, so, Lucy, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, is it green when it's on or am I on now? Red is, red on. is on. Okay, thank you. No. 
Okay, then the slides will come up now, Amy. Oh, there they are, there they are, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I'm the technology idiot in this room, so I apologize for that. And it's a delight to be here with you today. I'm Lucy Savitz, and you've already heard my formal introduction, but I have to say, I'm a former NAC member, so I really applaud you all for the work that you're doing, and it's a privilege to be here with you today. And the comments that I'm gonna to make today are not my own. I'm one of 16 members of the subcommittee that has been working on patient and workforce safety. And um, you know, in my role, what I've really tried to do in addition to being a subject matter expert myself, I've tried to create a safe space for a diversity of opinions and perspectives to come forward and openly share. I've been, a, I'll be a spokesperson for the group today. I hope I'm a trusted voice by the members of our um, SNAC. And I've tried to be an honest broker because there have obviously been areas where there's been some contention and disagreement and um, interest in, in putting different um, opinions forward. And lastly, a consensus builder. So with 16 people, you can imagine how difficult it was um, to bring everybody together. And am I forwarding the slides or are you? Thank you. Um, this was our schedule. Um, and if you can imagine scheduling 16 people in a short time period to show up for all of these meetings, you can imagine how difficult the ARC staff um, had to work very di diligently to get people to show up. We started on um, September 7th with our first meeting where we did really level setting to bring everybody together to a common platform. And then we, we really launched into the work quickly and utilized the time in between meetings um, using email and other forms of communication so that we could actually build the momentum and build the buy-in for the particular group. So featuring the patient voice, um, Krista Hughes actually really helped us bring a patient forward to really center and focus the work we're doing on the patient voice. At the next meeting on October 10th, we've really focused on the learning network and workplace safety. Um, a colleague of mine at Texas Health um, actually brought forward one of the speakers who talked about the experiences of healthcare workers. Because I think, you know, while many of us have worked in patient safety, this notion of workplace safety, not just well being, but safety in the workplace setting has become incredibly important. And then, you know, we went through a modified Delphi process to try and achieve some consensus on where we were going, and then um, did a, a post meeting. Um, email and final review of what I'm going to present to you today. And hopefully a number of you have already read in the pre-reading materials, the information that we sent out, because I'm not going to read all of these slides to you. Um, but at any rate, the other concept that I drew upon from colleagues that I've worked with in Sweden is this notion of drawing a red thread through. So, you know, we are not creating this notion of patient safety de novo. We are not creating this notion of workplace safety de novo, which everybody around this table knows. But what we tried to do is to look across all of the various activities that are happening and draw a red thread through them. And so when you work in Sweden, one of the things you talk about is drawing a red thread through when you can sort of connect these disparate ideas and um, opportunities that are related in a, in a way that wouldn't have previously been connected. And so that was something that was very important to us as we did this work. And so we put together an environmental scan and in the environmental scan, we anchored it on the four foundational areas of the, sorry, the four foundational areas of the national action plan. So governance, leadership and culture, patient and family engagement, workforce safety, and learning networks. So we anchored everything across those things and we mapped them out into three categories. Were they related activities? Were they available resources and tools? Or were there potential partners? And I can tell you that we have over 75 resources that are mapped into these categories that are available. So when we think about efficiency and progress and moving quickly, accelerating the pace of the work we're doing, the opportunity to leverage a lot of existing work, a lot of existing energy across public and private enterprises exists. And so I want to leave you with that, that thought um, as you look at the aims that we've put forward and the measures and sub goals that we've put forward. The other thing that I've been talking to a lot of people about is how do we how do we think about equity? So most notably people think about making sure that we include, we're inclusive of all of the patient populations that are being served by a health system, by a health plan, by a government. 
Um, that, that has always been an important precept for equity. But the other part of equity that I think is really important in this domain, both in terms of patient and workforce safety, is thinking about all levels of care across the entire care continuum. Most of the work that we've done has really focused on hospital-based care at the expense of other levels in the care continuum. And there are new ones that are emerging. Hospital at home came out of the pandemic, um, even though the VA had done it before. Um, I see my VA counterpart over there. Um, <laughs> pioneer in hospital-based um, hospital at home. Um, and then you know telehealth, all the telehealth work that's going on. These are new levels of care. And so we have to think about how do you ensure patient safety and workplace safety across that care continuum, not just in hospital settings. And so there needs to be equity for all stakeholders in this process. And in the aims that we've put forward as we talk about we, who is we? Um, this we is really sort of this intersecting Venn diagram. And so it's a collective we. It's the private partners and patients and families that we will engage in this work. The National Steering Committee will continue to be a, a driving guiding force in this work. The federal partners that are available to us and have really participated along the way as we sort of gathered information and in making these recommendations. And then lastly, intervention groups groups that are willing to step up to the table and work with us on rapid cycle projects where we can demonstrate what's possible. Not just you know, hearing from people, what, what have we done before? Let's show people what's possible with what we have. So I'm gonna launch into the, the aims here. And there are four aims and one recommendation. So the first overarching aim has to do with how can we you know, really engage and support every organization in the United States to commit to operationalizing the foundational elements of the National Action Plan to provide and assure safer care everywhere for all. This is an umbrella aim. And I, again, I won't read to you um, the sub goals that are associated with it. They're here on the slide for you and you can peruse them as I'm talking. But I think it's really important for us to understand one of the comments that came up in our discussion was, we know what to do. The question is, why aren't we doing it? You know, and so I think there's a real role for implementation science here. There's a real role for us to think about how do we take studies and evidence that, that have been generated in one setting and then apply them to other kinds of settings so we don't have to continuously reinvent the wheel. Um, we take what we know and then we adapt it and adopt it in different settings. The next aim has to do with engineering safe practices. And this one I think is a really interesting one. This is something that we actually worked on at Intermountain Healthcare years ago when I was there. Um, but through partnership with technology vendors, the FDA, ONC and other relevant partners, how can you sort of drive measurable changes in healthcare technology? And we know technology is advancing at the speed of sound almost. <laughs> um, but how can we get them to think about how do they design for safety as we're, they're designing the equipment. And I think this is incredibly important when you think about our, our transient workforce now. You have a lot of um, nurses and physicians and other healthcare providers that are moving across settings, even in within a single community. And so the extent to which we can standardize some of the equipment to make it safer for people um, and, and to provide that safe care in a way that hasn't been possible, frankly. And so, you know, instead of having a sticky note on a machine that says, turn it to this setting, we can actually design the technology so that it actually goes to the right setting. Um, so not rocket science here, but bringing partners together in a way that they historically have not been brought together. And so we have suggested um, sub goals and measures associated with these, with, you know, one of the first actions being, let's identify five things we could do and then we could disseminate across these various partners. And are there ways that we could build in sort of incentives for people to, to do the right thing, basically? The next goal has to do with the learning capacity. And this is an area where I, you know, I consider myself a thought leader in the country around learning health systems. Um, thanks to ARC, I've been one of the co-PIs of one of the LHS K-12s. 
Um, and they're, we're continuing to build up our capacity to learn as a system. You know, I tell people, if I were teaching healthcare administration in the early 1980s, and you said, what are the functional areas of a healthcare delivery system? There'd be, you know, patient care services, marketing, medical records, you know, et cetera. <clears throat> IT wouldn't have been a C-suite level functional area in the early 1980s. And for some of us, it doesn't feel like that was that long ago. Um, I believe within the next five years, if not sooner, there will be a learning capacity in healthcare delivery systems. They, they have to. If you look at the proportion of healthcare systems around the country that are having less than 3% margins, in many cases, negative margins, they can't continue to do business and implement things that are not evidence-based. And so building up that capacity, whether they partner for others or make it happen. And, and so what we need to think about as a nation is how do we build up a national capacity for learning and sharing that information? You know, I, I think one of the things that um, we've lost in our society is this notion of community and the sense of community. And having worked for a variety and with a variety of delivery systems around the country through the High Value Healthcare Collaborative and other activities, some health systems view their advances as being in, having intellectual property and capitalization opportunities. I think we need to get people on board that this is a community effort to learn together. And if we can at least get people to agree, let's not compete on patient safety. Let's not complete, compete on workforce safety. If we can agree that we can come together in those kinds of ways and then share that learning rapidly so that we're not wasting time, effort, money, and resources to replicate these kinds of studies over and over again. That we can share what we've learned, we can implement it in different places and, and learn how to enhance what we're doing and do it better and faster. And so there are suggested measures um, and sub goals associated with this one as well. Um, as we think about that learning capacity, there are a number of people on the um, SNAC who have expertise in this particular area, and you can see that reflected in the comments that are made. We actually have um, a lot of work that's been done, been happening nationally between the Learning Health Community and Academy Health, where we're creating a maturity model for learning health systems. That's a tool that can be used. It can serve as a roadmap for healthcare systems. It's in, it's open source. It's in, you know, it's available to anybody. I'm co-leading it if you want more information on it. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, but there are ways in which we can measure how quickly people are coming on board to become learning health systems and to engage in these processes. But it's going to take the government's help to create the infrastructure necessary to support that sort of large scale learning, large scale spread and scale. And I know, you know, there's some really interesting things happening with PCORI right now with the Health System Improvement Initiative, the HSII you've probably heard about, you know, there are ways in which how can we spread and scale things? That's the issue. We know it works. Even within a system like UPMC, we have 40 hospitals. Just because you're doing something well at one hospital doesn't mean you're doing something well at all of the hospitals. You know what you're doing, but how do you get it spread and scale even within a single delivery system? I remember when we were working on the High Value Healthcare Collaborative, Rob Nessie from Mayo said at one of our board meetings, he said, we, we don't know how to take what we learn that works and get it out there in the field. And so I think there's an appetite for this kind of thing to happen and for us to work together in different aims, different ways. Um, the education and training aim is, I think, near and dear to my heart because now I'm back in academia and I'm training. And I have to tell you, I looked through the curriculum at University of Pittsburgh in the Health Policy and Administration Department in our MHA program. None of our administrative leaders learn anything about patient safety or workforce safety. It's not in the curricula. So we talk about how do we educate physicians? How do we educate nurses? How do we educate other paraprofessionals? But we haven't thought about the administrators who are gonna be making the decisions about, can you get resources to do this work? I think that's an important omission. Um, and I personally am taking that up as a charge. I've, I teach a class, so I have a little control over some of that. Um, and so next year in 2024, it's going to be in the curricula at Pitt, but it's not everywhere. And so I think that's something we have to think about. I have two nieces who are in nursing school. In nursing school, leading nursing schools, they both trained at different ones. They never talked about patient safety training. 
So I think there's a real opportunity for us to think, how do we train the workforce of the future? And how do we help support the current workforce? I talked to a lot of physicians when we were doing this work about workplace safety. One of them is an oncologist at the Mayo Clinic. And she shared with me during the pandemic, many of the nurses and doctors had to have police escorts home and protection at their homes. Um, and she you know, treats patients on a routine basis. And I said, well, is there ever any physical violence or confrontations in your, your engagements with your patients? And she said, all the time. And, and, and I thought, as I'm listening to her, there's almost this normalization of this behavior that it's expected. And, and what job should you expect that you go to work and you're going to be sworn at and people are going to slap you and be upset with you? You know, I think we need to think about how do we get people to report instead of it being sort of a normalized behavior and how do we use that data and that information to try and intervene in ways that protect our workforce? And, you know, healthcare is not alone in this, but we, we are losing at leaps and bounds the care, the care professionals that we need to support our healthcare delivery system. And so we have to make it a safe place for them to do their jobs effectively. And so again, um, subject, suggested sub goals and measures for these as well. And then lastly, our recommendation. So we really recommend, and this is ARC, so I would be remiss if I left here without saying something like this, but we recommend establishing a funding and cross-agency research agenda on high priority safety gaps to address policy, payment, and practice knowledge and needs that will support the National Advisor Action Alliance. One of the things I can tell you that was a, a, a very obvious uh, agenda item here you know, when we were meeting with our federal partners and they were sharing with the data that's already collected, there's very little data that's already collected around workplace safety that can be used and, act and, be, and be actionable. Doesn't mean there's not data collected because we know that there's a ton of data that's being collected, but is the data actionable in a way that's useful? So I think there's clearly work around measurement that needs to be done. There are other kinds of things. If you think about taking safe practices that have been developed and honed in hospital settings. You can't just transplant those into, you know, an ambulatory surgery center or a primary care practice or an urgent care center. You have to adapt it in some kind of way. And one of the things that we, we know from implementation science is as you adapt things, you have to refine like who's gonna do the work, how's the work gonna be in, in sort of woven into the workflow of the healthcare organization. And so there's a lot of studies that need to be done to allow us to advance this. And if we think about aligning this across the federal agencies, <clears throat> so are there things in place like HSIIs at PCORI where we could, part, or could partner with them to you know, take safety practices and try and use that network of 42 health systems across the United States and actually quickly mobilize. These are 42 health systems that already said that they're eager, they're eager to share what they learn. They're eager to spread and scale learning. You know, how do, how do we leverage those kinds of opportunities? How do we work with CMS and some of the CMMI innovation work that's been done or some of the demonstrations that have been done so we can align the incentives that help people do the right thing. Um, and then we had posed these questions to you in the pre-read. Um, and I hope we can sort of use this as a launching pad into the larger discussion about what I've presented to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions, um, give a little bit of color and detail to any of the recommendations that we've made to you today. But again, it's been a real honor and thank you. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's, let's jump right into the discussion here. Let's start that uh, discussion with uh, group two, um, Ron, um, giving some uh, feedback on uh, the discussion that we had in our, in our group in group, group two. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the for the work you've done on this. <clears throat> um, so I, I think we we had a vigorous conversation in our in our group about this topic, patient safety being all near and dear to our our hearts. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of broad categories that emerged. Um, I think one would be um, interoperability of data, and that in the broadest sense um, is it, is it payers sharing sh sharing data among themselves about the hospitals? Is it medical records um, going with patients? 
uh, following them along in different healthcare settings, mm -hmm. uh, and and basically a, a feeling of alignment to to better share data. So I think that was one of the thoughts about um, patient safety. Um, again, consolidating patient information. Second issue that came up was was clinical decision support, mm -hmm. and uh, I think there's there's people perceive value to, to clinical decision support. Uh, people perceive um, um, value in clinical decision support. Mm -hmm. And I guess what the topic we talked about were thresholds, where if you will, meaningful, meaningful um, uh, clinical decision support. Uh, the example I always use and is I work in a pediatric ER. Mm -hmm. And every time I prescribe Motrin one time for a patient with fever, two-year-old with fever, I get a support about, did you check a creatinine? No, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, if I do an enema for, for a child with constipation, I'm telling you all the secrets of the patient of a pediatric ER, you know, I get a, a, a report that says, did you check a mag and a FOS? So, so the problem with that is that they're not, they're not actually neutral, they're negative because mm -hmm. they contrib contribute to alarm fatigue. So how exactly. we get clinical decision support that is clinician driven as opposed to lawyer driven. Um, mm -hmm. Apologies to all my lawyer friends. Um, the third, the third part was about a standardization and clinical pathways to drive safety and quality. Uh, in terms of, and that, you know, we, I think that's par partially cultural. Um, the world I live in, which is pediatric oncology, that's putting kids on study is very, very common. It's, it's the normal. It's your culture. In other fields of medicine, it's not. So, how do we do that? We talked about whether that's generational or not. That. Us old guys just really don't want to deal with um, clinical pathways and maybe the younger generation that's used to Google and looking things up on their phone as opposed to carrying a 500 pound, mm -hmm. 500 page book in their um, white coat, you know, may, may change things. So that was one of that. And then, so that was sort of around patient safety. Uh, around workplace safety, we had, um, I guess, a difficult conversation, if you will is that it almost, we almost bifurcated in that there are sort of two, two groups of, of, of threats, to our, threats to our safety, if you will. One are the are folks who are, have their mental faculties and aren't intoxicated and choose to act poorly. And we talked about some states that have made those felonies, zero tolerance policies, all of those things um, to try to protect people to not accept this as normal behavior. And then the second where we bifurcated was there are folks who have behavioral illnesses um, who are on, on drugs or intoxicated with alcohol and who are you know, good people once they're not intoxicated mm -hmm. or once their behavioral health has been addressed. And so how do you, know, do you treat those two folks, do two groups of patients differently? Yeah, I, if I could just make a couple of comments. Please. I think, you know, one, the, the comment that you made about like clinical decision support, and I think <clears throat> this issue of burden you know, there's burden in data collection, there's alarm fatigue burden, but I think, you know, we have to be smart. I was talking to somebody um, offline before we started um, meeting again today, and, you know, this notion of AI, AI has been around a really long time, and people have been doing machine learning <laughs> and creating algorithms and things like this that will alert the physicians, you know, but the question is, should you do it? We, I actually have a paper I wrote, like, should you do it, you know, if there's nobody interested in doing it? And, and I think, you know, this notion of burden came up in our snack as well, that, you know, as we're sort of working through, you know, reporting issues, um, as we're working through the data collection issues, we have to be very cognizant of the issues around the burden that it places on the care delivery team so that it's not just adding something additional to that particular team. And then, you know, the issue about the patient safety, I think one of the things that is important in the recommendation we made, and I think Krista would maybe want to comment on this, is the, that, that all of the healthcare entities are asked to do an assessment and create a plan, but that plan needs to include patient and family reports. And I think, you know, for those of us who've sat at the bedside you know, with a patient um, and who's a family member and they're declining, we see that very early. And if you think about, you know, rapid response teams or, you know, and, and the extent to which many facilities have engaged patient and families in the reporting in rapid response teams, for example, I think there are ways that we can universally bring the patient voice into the, the conversations about patient safety. 
But it, it sounds like you had a really interesting discussion. Yeah, we all also I should, I should add that we all universally endorsed, sorry, I'm going to throw it, we all universally endorse a safety by design. That is uh -huh. a wonderful idea and long overdue. Great. Awesome. Um, I'm going to add, I see, I see the questions um, popping up, but I'm going to, um, before I get to the list, I'm going to ask Krista to, to, um, to go ahead and, uh, and add and comment as well, including anything that you want to pull from your discussion this morning. Wait, what? Anything that you guys had from your, your discussion this morning um, in the pre-work. Um, so, yes, thank you for the presentation. I mean, it was an honor to be on this um, committee. It was a lot of work and a lot of information. But me being a patient advocate, I always continue to say that this, whatever we do in the National Action Alliance, one needs to be the continuum of care. Anything from birth to death to me is consider patient safety. And in my opinion, a lot of change, and this to me is a learning network because you've got to have patients' voices and narratives and their stories and use those as part of your learning networks and your education pieces. It was interesting you're telling me you're starting speaking to teaching administrators about patient safety. Um, I was just teaching some med students the other day and they didn't even know what patient safety was. And I was like, whoa, you're our future. And they had no idea. So I'm, you know, I, I just learned about that. But this is just the, the work we've put in. But I think that from a patient perspective, you got to have all those. You've got to have care coordination. You got to have their voice. You need to have the learning networks. I think patients and families should be involved in that as well as education because you're not going to learn anything about what patients want unless you actually hear their voice. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Krista. Um, taking the list, uh, Shaji, you're up. Okay, so it's, again, it's great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. just make one, a couple of comments and one question. Uh, but before that, I want to introduce my background because this is highly relevant. My comment is on the second one, uh, engineering C practice. Mm -hmm. I was the PI of the ONC SHARP program oh. more than 10 years ago. And our SHARP focused on patient-centered cardiac support. The whole mm -hmm. thing is about EHR safety and usability. So after the grant is over, I think uh, the biggest contribution I think we made was to make the testing of patient safety of the EHR system, a mandatory requirement for the meaningful use. Uh, we know that vendor did that, but minimally, not really much. Mm -hmm. But I think now 10 years later, I think things have, have improved dramatically. So now uh, for the next 10 years, whatever, there are a lot of new opportunities here. Number one, the vendors, the actual control market and the big vendors, right? And if you do not work with them together, you cannot really achieve a lot of things which are mm -hmm. our business, patients, patient center, right? So one thing is, that's the question now, whether in your the subcommittee, you have a consideration of getting the vendors and the private public together Mm -hmm. some real effort, not just uh, meetings and recommendation, some real actions, even including some funded projects with the vendors together to address or help them, not really mm -hmm. find problems because the control platform, you add any users and customers, you understand how the whole ecosystem. If you can work with the vendors together, for instance, do some data mining of their data. We have a lot of data. There are a lot of adverse events. Mm -hmm. You can easily identify that's number one. Number two, to design together for safety yeah. in our system. So far, the vendors do not really want outsiders getting involved. Right. I mean, I think it's a very interesting question. You know, I, I know like even within my own system at UPMC, we have four different EHR systems that are operational in one system. <laughs> Um, and, you know, obviously we know the two big players are, you know, Cerner and Epic in, in our country, but um, I think there have to be ways in which it becomes an expectation of the norm that the vendors work together. We've seen examples where, you know, when Epic with their sepsis, you know, um, uh, sepsis alert, 
you know, and, and it was, there were problems with it. And there are other alerts that have followed and we've developed the evidence that have shown the problems in those alerts. And I think it's because this very problem that you've identified that the people in healthcare delivery are not working in partnership with the vendors. And so if we can create a mechanism, and that's one of the things that we've recommended, and that the vendors together with public-private partners will come together and identify what are at least five things. Can you think of five things that we could do? And they may be EHR related. They may be, there may be some other kind of things that are recommended on, you know, like ventilator controls or something like that. But, you know, have them identify what they can come to the table on and participate in where we, we are now pushing this notion that patient safety is not a competitive factor. That they're doing it for the good of the citizenry and the customers that they serve, basically. No, That's a culture change, I know, but... Yeah, yeah I just want to add one more thing I forgot to mention, which is important. Uh, the vendors are good, that they are working hard to answer a lot of questions, uh -huh. solve a lot of problems. I think by, the, by themselves, it's not sufficient. I, that, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. I think that we need to come together and do it versus it's something that's delivered to the delivery system. So it's something they co-designed together. Yeah. You know, one other angle on the, on the vendors is they are working hard, but they're working hard on lots of things. And so how do we, how do we help them with their prioritization mm -hmm. of what they're, what they're working on and what they're putting their engineering talent um, towards, again, in a collaborative way. Uh, Kamal, you're up. Uh, wonderful discussion. You know, I want to zoom in a little bit up about the sort of oper oper operationalization question and the cross-cutting component. And I think there's two potential sort of opportunities where uh, the AHRQ is beautifully sort of positioned to help bring other folks along. The first is sort of re-looking at our sort of uh, tried and true tools, things like event reporting, things like root cause analysis or event analysis, things like proactive risk assessments. And how do you ingrain equity into those functions? Um, and so really sort of look at the structures of safety. I think that'll help support um, sort of uh, safety across the continuum. Lots of thoughts on that that can be shared at another time. The second thing that I'd like to um, spotlight is that as we're thinking about training the next generation, as we're thinking about probing our systems to uncover problems, as we're thinking about changing culture and practice, I want to, uh, the group to really uh, look deeply at healthcare simulation. Um, almost all pre-professional pre programs have simulation programs. Um, you know, which have now moved from simply training folks to now really improving quality and safety. And there's a ton of, you know, sort of resources uh, and evidence around that. And so I'd really encourage the group to not create new, you know, sort of solutions, but maybe sort of spotlight some of those solutions that exist. Mm -hmm. Great points. I, I think, you know, in terms of training and culture, your, your points about simulation training are really important and it's not available very universally. I mean, it is in the big health systems, um, but not universally. And I think, um, you know, part of what we tried to do in our environmental scan where we've, you know, used the four foundational areas of the National Action Alliance Plan to actually anchor our looks at related activities, potential partners and things like that. We're talking about Let's not recreate the wheel. There's no sense. It's only going to slow us down. Let's look at what's already happening and leverage those kinds of things. And I think simulation is a good example um, to think about when you think about it. I think in terms of equity, when we think about equity, um, I've, I've done a lot of work and interviewed a lot of patients over the years. And one of the things that I think is important, particularly as we talk about like in incorporating patient and family engagement in the reporting process, not everybody's comfortable reporting. There are cultural differences that inhibit people from speaking out. There are generational quest issues that keep people from speaking out. Um, and, and there are, you know, instances where, you know, there's not anybody listening to these people when they try and say something <laughs> um, because they, they don't look right or they don't have the white coat on or, you know, what have you. And so I think, you know, as we think about equity, we have to think about 
Um, not just you know, the color of skin, but we have to think about educational attainment, literacy issues. We have to think about language issues. We've got to think about cultural issues um, because those are all barriers for patient and family engagement. And I, you know, I'm, this is nothing new to anybody sitting around this table, I'm sure. I see a lot of people nodding their heads, um, but I think these are the challenges that face us in this multicultural society that you know, we, we live in and we thrive in. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Savitz. Um, first, great presentation. There's a lot of information and I'm in the background of pharmacy, specifically looking at it from a regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so I, I could go on all day and have conversation with you about many things that you said, but there were a couple of things that I wanted to point out and I had two questions. One, um, <clears throat> excuse me, was how is, um, how have we defined healthcare system? And because I see it throughout the documents that I was reading, um, but there wasn't a true definition. And I know one of the questions talked about a continuum of care. And so I see that continuum of care specifically from when the patient goes to the doctor all the way down to when that patient is handed medication. Um, and so that's the first question. And the second question, and, and you brought up, you know, we need to change technology. But then you also mentioned a national capacity of learning, which I completely agree with. And I think this is where uh, AHRQ um, can, can implement some sound footing. But how do we share the information and our learnings rapidly? Um, you mentioned removing capitalism in, in our small group. We're also talking about there's litigation, there's reputation, there's shame. How do we prevent transparency of events um, and, and corrective actions? And, and what are some things that we can do? I, I, we work also a lot with FDA as it pertains to compounding medications. And so mm -hmm. we've been working with them on like an information sharing network. And this is where I think uh, AHRQ can come in is we have, we can put the platform here to do that, but how do we remove some of those barriers and some of that stigma that's there associated with mm -hmm. the reputational or monetary damage to be able to do this so that we can share this information and learn to provide better quality uh, patients uh, healthcare? Yeah, I'd love to talk with you later. Email me, you know, I'm very responsive. Um, and those are great points. First of all, let me say, I didn't say end capitalism. <laughs> I have an MBA and I've been a financial <laughs> officer for a health system. So I did not say that. I just said that there's this threat <laughs> to people sharing because, you know, I, I'll tell you, for example, we, um, we were part of something called the High Value Healthcare Collaborative. And leading up to healthcare reform, it was created. Jack Wenberg had looked across the country at all the systems. And he said that Intermountain, Dartmouth, and Mayo were the three leading health systems. And so we came together and we had this vision of could we bring together 19 delivery systems across the country that sort of represented the cross section of the industry. So it wasn't all Mayo's, for example. Um, and can we learn together? Went through this lengthy legal process, created a data trust where we brought all of the data together, EHR data, we brought together administrative data, we brought together claims data, um, and we're able to do a lot of absolutely incredible work and share things very, very rapidly. What we, what we learned was there were three systems that dropped out and they dropped out because they felt like what they were improving upon became commercialized property was intellectual property to them. But the other systems actually stayed in it and shared very broadly and we all benefited from it. And so I think it's this cultural change that we're a community of learners and you're not gonna be able to do it on everything, but for at least the limited set of things, you say for patient safety and workforce safety, you can innovate in other areas and you can you know, sell it commercially you know, that's fine. We understand that it's a revenue stream for places and they need to do that. So I think, you know, let me answer that question first. And then you were also asking about the definition of healthcare system. So stay tuned for our report. It's due December 19th. <laughs> and I'm already having panic attacks over that, but I'll be sure the definition is in there and you're correct. We used it as a short -term, shorthand term for the care continuum. And, and I agree that it's all the way up to pharmacy. And I will tell you, you know, even the compounding pharmacies tend to get left out of this. And I, I, just an interesting fact, right? this is completely somewhat unrelated, but it is a patient safety issue with, with these new diabetic drugs that are being used for weight loss. Because there's limited insurance coverage, people are going online and buying compounded similes 
And there's a huge growing death rate associated with that. So I think, you know, it is important that we think about the entire care continuum and then how do these sort of policy issues influence these kinds of actions, you know? So we're operating in an ecosystem. Thank you. And I'll look for your email. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I thought I saw Cincy up next. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my ears perked up immediately with the characterization of ending capitalism because, you know, I often <laughs> talk about the challenges of um, trying to center patients and having, you know, biz basically healthcare being a business where um, the bottom line is not necessarily the care of the patients, but, you know, just staying in business making a profit, even if you're a nonprofit hospital, um, we still see uh, that some of those actions as if they were for profit hospital. I think that the point of, um, you know, addressing that barrier of how do we, what things even within, um, you know, a extractive capitalist um, model of healthcare are gonna be the safe harbors Mm -hmm. um, of non-competing. I think that is brilliant. You know, like, I think that is really important. Obviously, I would love to see that safe harbor get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but uh, safety for sure um, seems like it should be something um, that not be compet, you know, should not be a competition. Um, because the other piece around this is that there is, I think, a very um, deep misunderstanding um, of the extent to which people seeking healthcare can even, you know, even do comparison, like it's not the same market. And it's, a, it doesn't have the same market um, drivers, um, because the, de this, the decision makers on like, what can I, wh what hospital can I go to? Um, is not me often, right? It usually it often is not either because there are not a lot of hospitals or because of your insurance issues and all of that, right? So so there, that's just to say that agree 100% that finding ways to um, insulate patient safety from some of those rent seeking, you know, competitive nature of uh, the market is fundamental. And I would go an extra step in saying that I believe that the real way to get a fundamental strategy for getting at true health equity is to um, shift our mindset to think of health inequities, especially by race, gender, ethnicity, um, SOGI status, disability status, seeing them as actual medical errors, right? Um, but that's maybe, you know, too far for now. Um, I did want to directly along those lines, um, address the point of like, saying that as more and more hospitals are having to deal with narrower and narrower margins that they will turn to what to evidence-based and will have to turn to evidence-based practices. Um, I would just challenge again, evidence-based for what? One of the biggest challenges that we have seen like out of models out of CMMI um, is the fact that what they're looking at is just ROI. Um, the, the success of a model is being, is just assessed by how much money they were able to save if they did or not, and not by actually like what happened to patient outcomes. Um, so just wanted to put that kind of asterisk that I'm not sure we have necessarily always the best evidence base, or I'm not that, I mean, we, there are issues with our evidence base and it being very biased, you know, in terms of who's in that, who are the, who were the folks in the studies. Um, but I also think that, um, the the there is little um, motivation right now with the underlying financial uh, uh, structures in the healthcare system um, to work towards equity or safety or any of these issues, um, given the the underlying um, incentive disincentives. Um, and then I also wanted to just make a flag from an equity uh, standpoint that we need to really be careful about um, the biases that can be in, you know, hardwired into algorithms and AI. Um, 
I there's a lot of interest, and I think even even in health you know in health equity circles of how these tools can be really advantageous to accelerate equity, but it really matters. Like the devil is really in the details, and for that you need to have the right. Um, not only you have to have the right inputs and make sure that the evidence space you're dealing with is an evidence space that is diverse and that kind of distinguishes between um, different, uh, for example, variations in, in how different populations um, react to certain treatments, um, but that there also needs to be, because of that specifically, room and the ability for um, individual judgment of, of of providers to not have to go through, you know, 17 different flags to be able to um, address the fact that albuterol does not work as well in black and Puerto Rican kids if they're having an asthma attack and they wanna do something different, right? So though they're, though they're just, that's just another flag. And I'm sure as we do more precision medicine research and all of that, we will find more and more of these um, uh, differences. Yeah, I, you, a lot of there, a lot of comments there, and I'm not going to be able to unpack them all. But let me make two comments in response to that. One is um, when you talk about the algorithms and race, I think there's a, um, you know, most people who get trained in PhD programs to be health services researchers, you, you get sort of a formulaic kind of approach, and people sort of throw race and ethnicity in there, thinking that it's a proxy for something else. Okay. But I was just reading a paper the other day, it was either in New England Journal or JAMA, where a major cardiac algorithm um, has removed race from it entirely um, because they, there was no justification for race being in there. There was no biological reason that you know, people were you know, more or less prone to heart attack because of their skin color. So I think some progress is being made and I think people have to be smarter about how they use those, those variables. And I will tell you, having worked across health systems across the United States, the data that they usually have is crap, anyhow. <laughs> so, you know, let me just say that. <laughs> um, and you can quote me on that. But um, the other point I'd like to make is about the ROI comment. So, you know, even if you're a nonprofit, you have to keep the lights on in an organization and you have limited resources. And so um, I don't think that, you know, in, in general, if you're making the case effectively, and one of the things we do in the learning health system K-12 is teach our researchers how to speak the language of C-suite individuals, you know, you can make a case for things and they call it sort of ROI kind of thing. And I've tried to move people towards the value equation. Um, and fortunately, I've worked for healthcare systems that, you know, they're their philosophy is in there and they're in the business of providing optimal medical care. And so their decisions are a little bit different. And sometimes we lose money on some of the things we do, but it's the right thing to do for our patients. Um, so I think if you can move to the value equation, but I, I do think, you know, they have, they can't do everything. And so we have to help them prioritize the things that they can do that move the needle in a way that we know will make a difference. And that's where the evidence becomes really important. Thank, thanks for that. And uh, it's a fascinating um, concept around, um, uh, since you mentioned this, this idea of um, a healthcare disparity as a patient safety event um, and really, really kind of tackling it in that way. I mean, I, I don't know that it's too, too much since I think, I think, I think maybe it's just the right time to start having that kind of, that kind of conversation. Um, given it, I won't, I won't give you my, my, my little spiel on bias and AI, but I have one. So at some point <laughs> we, will, we will talk about that. I can give you my like 30 seconds and I can give you my much longer one. Um, Kathy, you're up. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to, to amplify what we've been talking about related to system and device integration and interoperability, I wonder if it's time for um, interoperability to become a standard and expected rather than an add-on. Um, and that, that comes both from a patient safety perspective, from a burden perspective, and from a redundancy perspective um, related to what it does to, you know, disparities in our data. So I, I wanted to make that point. Um, you know, when we think about learning health systems, we think about uh, the generation of practice-based evidence um, that should be used uh, along with our published and disseminated external evidence. Um, and I think both those things are important and they're important to think about not only to help us decide 
what we should be doing, but what we should stop doing. And de-implementation is just as important. Um, and reducing unnecessary care variation is also an important thing for us to consider as we think about, you know, what are, what are we learning from what we do that could help reduce variation? And I'm gonna make that patient safety point from the perspective of an increasingly novice particularly nursing workforce. Mm -hmm. And the more care variation there exists in the care environment, the more chance and the more risk there is for a patient safety event just related to the experience of the workforce. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to call out those points. Really, I just gave a talk on that very topic. And I think the de-implementation point is really critical in this. So as we're putting things in place, taking things away that are redundant or don't need to be there anymore is crucial. Thank you. Yeah, in, um, in IT, we call it app rationalization, right? Where, you know, you actually look at your total number of applications that are, that are you know, kind of that you support and you just start cranking out the one, cranking down on the ones that are, that are don't, aren't, aren't as used so that you can actually bring the new ones in and, and you can kind of have a net, a net zero. Um, Neil, you're up. There. Is that on? There we go. Okay. So capitalism doesn't have to be bad. Uh, I want to go on record. <laughs> I didn't say uh, that. No, 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 no. I know you didn't. <laughs> Lucy, great presentation. But actually, thing about your comments about mm -hmm. value and you know putting this in a value framework, I'm thinking about the fact that increasingly provider organizations, particularly these large health systems, are seeking uh, risk contracts and value-based contracts. And I think it's important for us to think about how that can drive safety. So the idea of, first of all, being specific on what are the safety metrics that should be mm -hmm. built into all of these contracts? How should these things be measured? Uh, I, I think it's a real opportunity for us in terms of both the measurement of it and uh, holding the health systems accountable. You know, your question about how to sort of accelerate change and adaptation mm -hmm. is making the economic argument uh, for safety. Mm -hmm. And so thinking more about how can we uh, quantify the cost, not just the human cost, but right. the economic cost uh, from the provider perspective of unsafe care and then how can we actually uh, improve outcomes and economic outcomes? Great points, completely agree with you. Thank Liz. you. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. All your color commentary was fascinating. It was really fun to listen to you. I have uh, two, two questions. Uh, I love the overarching aim. When I read that, I just said, yes, that's the overarching aim that should be. But I'd like your thoughts on how we can do it. Every healthcare system and supporting organization commits to operationalizing. You have all these, I don't see a list of everybody on the a subcommittee, but I've heard you have great representation from all the main stakeholders that would be involved in operationalizing this. What are your thoughts on how that overarching aim might actually become a reality? Yeah, I think, you know, this is an area that we sort of went back and forth on quite a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> And again, we're thinking about health systems very broadly, thinking across the continuum of care. And um, I think that we were, we're, we were judicious in how we came to the sub goals associated with it. So the first sub goal that's completed in the first year is that all of these entities complete an assessment. Okay, and many places are doing assessments already for various reporting requirements. So that's not that heavy of a lift, frankly. So we tried to make it um, so that it was achievable, but at the same time that it was sort of a reach to move forward. And if you go to the IHI website, and I'm not plugging IHI here, but if you go to the IHI website, they have an assessment tool that's already developed, that's in place there. Thousands, I don't remember the exact number, but it's over 9,000 healthcare entities have completed that assessment um, or, or at least downloaded the assessment tool. Um, and IHI is running training programs for people to do it. So I think what we've tried to do in, as we've laid out the sub goals, like how do you get to that? Um, we're, we're saying that over the next three years, there's sort of a, an accelerated pace of moving towards it. And we've tried to make it 
we've tried to frame it in a way that all comers that, that you know, a, a small, you know, primary care practice or a medical group practice, a hospital, a ambulatory, you know, surgery center, dialysis center, you know, all these entities could participate in this process in a way that they would start measuring and they, they would create a plan for doing it. They would create a part of their plan would be how to patients and family um, engage in that process and report in that process. So I, I, you know, again, you know, we struggled a lot on this and some of us wanted to go right to like within one year, everybody will have done X, Y, Z. And we're like, no, that can't happen. Um, so we think it's doable with what we've proposed. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, so it would be largely voluntary, um, but encouraged by peer and peer, peer pressure and professionalism. Well, depending on who you partner with, yeah. it could be a joint commission assessment. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not suggesting anything here because that's, we weren't, we weren't charged with how do you do it? We were charged with what should happen. I see. And, but, but there are, if you look at our environmental scan, which will be part of our report that we will deliver on December 19th, um, in there, we list partners and activities that are already taking place and you could use those levers. Great. And my other comment is on the other aim about engineering, where you say safety um, by design or in design, mm -hmm. um, I would encourage you to think about or comment about uh, safety and implementation. So a lot of devices as they implement have problems and there's meds mm -hmm. on, you, you sequester the device, you submit it to meds on, you get all this information. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something, that's a vehicle. Mm -hmm. But I think being a little bolder and somehow um, requiring is a strong word, but vendors who put devices out there to have a vehicle for safety reporting, the tool that has worked well in healthcare delivery settings, but to have that same safety reporting vehicle in a device world and an EHR world. Mm. My understanding is from those I've spoken with that um, some of the EHR vendors uh, do not encourage safety reporting for concerns about liability. And yet I would think um, providers are doing it, Mm. You know, why aren't vendors doing it? And why couldn't that be an expectation that would, you know, this is pro-capitalism, I suppose, right? So get them <laughs> to be incented yeah. to make safer products, not just yeah. by design, but sort of a safety in use um, yeah. part, something like that. That's a great comment. I'm taking notes and we are meeting on December 4th. So we'll be talking about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all this work. Caroline. Um, thank you for this terrific work and the rate at which you're putting out the work is really impressive. I um, have learned a lot from your comments today. I had a question and would love your perspective on the role of safety in telemedicine, uh, particularly telemedicine that's backed by private equity that is really not beholden to a health system, but beholden to a group of, you know, wanting to make a lot of money. Um, I, I would love to hear your perspective about this. Yeah, well, not, not a safety event, but I was driving here from Pittsburgh this morning, talking to a friend on the phone while I was driving, which I know you shouldn't do. But um, nevertheless, we actually had this very conversation that this is an area that there is almost no research being done to understand what are the safety profiles of a lot of these sort of vendor-based tools. And there are a lot of them that are out there. And if you think about them, they're not just coming to healthcare providers, they're coming to workplaces, which is almost completely outside of the scope of anything we've been talking about because the workplaces are actually are responsible, especially very large employers for the health of their employees and keeping them productive and active in the workforce. And so these, these groups are um, actually, you know, managing the, the health of their employees and they're not technically healthcare providers. And so thinking about how do we sort of bring that in? And there's this new sort of, you know, I've worked in healthcare for 40 years and I thought I knew everything about healthcare delivery and how it was organized. And a good friend of mine went to work at Delta Airlines, the head of their wellness area. And he said, do you know what quorum is? Do you know what accolade is? And I'm like, no, what is it? They're this intermediary group that it sells their services to large employers and they help manage the population health of the employee base. And they're, they're sort of actors in all this kind of thing. So I think, you know, as we think about this ecosystem, it tends to get bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And we're not going to be able to start with the you know whole inclusive area, but if we can start small and as all has already been commented, sort of work out from that, it's going to be really important. But you bring up an incredibly important point that we're not studying the safety in a lot of these um, tools that are being put out there. Uh, in the behavioral health space, I see it over and over and over and have grave concern about some of it. The um, failure of many apps to ask about suicide because of fear of liability, but what happens when, you know, there's not a safety plan for any of that, everything else that might lead or, or look down that path, or even the extent of apps that now replace a peer or replace a coach or replace a therapist. And it, it, you know, it, it's never ending. Um, I'm not there today because I'm speaking at the behavioral health tech conference and have just been overloaded thinking about, oh my gosh, where is this all going? It's, um, it's alarming to me. I, I completely agree with you. I, my friend at Delta Airlines gave a talk in my class last year when we talked about the business of healthcare and you know the role of you know private equity and healthcare delivery and some of these device tools that are, are sort of coming on board. And he put up a slide and the number, the sheer number of these uh, sort of telehealth services is, abs I mean, it's just growing astronomically. So it's an important point. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, it, it is a great point. And, and what you'll see with some of the some of these startup companies um, that are or startup or even or even more more um, advanced um, is they actually will go direct to direct to consumer, avoid the health systems um, and really avoid regulation um, so that they can go directly to consumers. So they'll kind of they'll skirt in the in between times um, in, in areas so that they can avoid the regulation. They can go straight in. But then but then you know, the concerns that you all are, are raising um get amplified in those settings. Uh, Joan, you're up. This was a great presentation. Thank you. I have a myriad of comments, but um, it's because there were so many great things spoken about. Um, first of all, I, I have to just weigh in on the capitalism piece. I'm not really even about what you said, but I feel unapologetic that sometimes safety is more expensive. And that doesn't mean we can be indiscriminate in spending and what have you, but it can't always be um, the priority is safety because if we're hurting people, it doesn't matter how nice we were and it doesn't matter if we cost less, mm -hmm. if you go home with the wrong leg missing, right? So right. I feel like I have to like throw that passion out there. Related to your comments about the assessment, I agree 100%. And I think you alluded to this, the Joint Commission requires hospitals to do self-assessments. Mm -hmm. CMS added in, um, regulation about boards being more deeply involved in right. patient safety, but I still see the ambulatory world very much unregulated yeah. as the wild, wild west mm -hmm. of healthcare, even though we haven't accomplished as much as we wanted to yet in hospitals. Um, in terms of sharing, I love the idea, but in Maryland, we have an opportunity um, through the patient, Maryland Patient Safety Center mm -hmm. to be sharing. The hoops you have to go through to be part of that are pretty heavy. PSOs are regulated and extraordinarily hard to yes. imagine them sharing. And in Maryland, we actually believe we have one of the best peer protections in our state across mm -hmm. other states in this country. So we'd have to find a way to get around some of that fear mm -hmm. of um, and, and reality of you know lawsuits and litigation and all of that. So I see that as a little bit complicated and hope that we have enough legal representation in there to help us get through some of that, even de-identifying is mm -hmm. still tough, um, I think, in today's world. And then I just wanted to comment because I think it was the article that we read in preparation mm -hmm. for this. I've been wrestling so much with, during the pandemic, it looked to me like processes that were tried and true fell apart completely 
with the number of SSIs and mm-hmm. CLABSIs and CAUDIs and all of those things. Yeah. And the article really addressed maybe we weren't really having those processes embedded in our systems. Maybe it was really more people driven mm-hmm. than we thought. And um, so in my estimation, we need to really peel that onion a bit more and understand how do we then really embed processes and does every system really have to identify their way to manage preventing CLAPSI, CAUDI, C. diff and all of those things like we see across the country today. So I don't know if you have answers for all of that, but really, really great presentation. Thank you. I, I mean, those are interesting comments and I've taken some notes as, as you were talking. I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, again, I, I think I've mentioned, I've been working in patient safety for decades now. Um, and um, the way you implement <laughs> makes a big difference on whether or not you weave it into the fabric of the workflow. And, you know, most people who are effective and, you know, I'm looking at Amy Kilborn who ran the query program. <laughs> um, so she should be answering this question, not me, but, um, you know, the, the very way that you go about implementation. And I think the, the sort of rigor that has come to implementation science, you know, when I first started doing this work, there wasn't anything called implementation science. And it's now become sort of a, a, a scientific area of inquiry where we've taken the sort of rigor and tools of research and we've applied it to that, that activity. And, you know, if you think about it, whether or not, you know, you're doing sort of quality improvement or, you know, RCTs kind of thing, the biggest failure is that most of what we learn and know never actually makes it into practice. Um, and, and I think, you know, part of this notion of being able to share this has been the struggle that many of us have had, including myself, to not have a place where you could publish this work and subject it to peer review and then share it more broadly. And so a couple of things have happened. Um, ARC actually funded Academy Health um, for a number of years on something called the Electronic Data Methods Forum. And they started a journal, eGEMS, it's now been sunsetted, but that was a place you could publish this kind of work. And then more recently in 2019, before the pandemic, I was at the National Academy of Medicine with all the journal, journal editors. And as I was listening to them talk, I wrote down on my paper distrust and I put a square around it. And the the real problem with a lot of this implementation science work is you're using real world data. You're not using claims data. And now there's enormous problems with claims data, but over the years we've become comforted with that knowledge and we've developed statistical methods and approaches to sort of overcome some of the problems of claims data. That's that's more in its infancy in using EHR based data and other data sources at the point of care. And um, after that meeting, I actually had the opportunity with funding, thanks from Amy at the VA, Kaiser Permanente, um, and the Journal of General Internal Medicine. We launched a special issue of um, Journal of General Internal Medicine where they would publish this kind of work and they've dedicated a space in that journal for this kind of work. Learning Health System journals come on on, um, online. Um, it's open source. And so I think, you know, all of the work and the ability, at least in the research community of the people doing this work, the DNI conference is happening in December. So there's there's a, an, an appetite for people to share this learning and accelerate the process. And so I have hope. I'm not always optimistic, but I have hope. <laughs> yes, Amy. You might if I jump the line and make a couple of really quick comments to that. So. I think this is where AHRQ can play a national leadership role in the science of quality improvement and implementation. First and foremost, there's a need to basically, um, first off, just to, I think that one of the tensions is is that you have researchers who are too research focused and they wanna be very rigid to a point where they're not flexible. And then that scares off, I think people who really wanna do true quality improvement. Mm -hmm. Implementation science and inquiry and what we've done in query is that we can, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can do rigorous Mm -hmm. quality improvement studies that actually get at the knowledge around you know what yes. quality improvement approaches are best and so one thing that hrq would be be a national leader is already a thought leader in is that you can do pragmatic trials like the mm-hmm. r18s those mechanisms are fantastic for being able to create knowledge about what works in quality improvement but mm-hmm. doing it in a rigorous way but that's also appealing to 
our health system leaders and our mm -hmm. patients too. So exactly. I think that's really a way of, of making, moving the needle there. Great points, thank you. All right, uh, and for the record, I do mind if you jump the line. So um, <laughs> uh, just so, we, so we're clear. Um, Ron, you're up. <clears throat> Thanks, well, sort of continuing along the path, path of discussing the pros and cons of um, capitalism. <clears throat> seems, 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 <laughs> I'm going to be embarrassed to leave this room. <laughs> they're going to they're going to they're going to take away. Yeah, they're going to take away your MBA. Um, they will. <laughs> it's, it seems like one of the biggest healthcare risks, safety risks to patients, is understaffing, um, mm -hmm. and that's not because they can't find the staff. It's because they're choosing to to increase their margin. And, and you know, for the record, I you know ran my own practice for 12 years, so I understand what it's like. You have to pay your bills. You have to pay your employees, but how do you address that? Again, you know, we talked about that with telehealth, with companies, for-profit companies um, springing up, private equity companies buying buying yeah. practices. How do we? That to me is the biggest threat to patient safety. I completely agree with you, and I don't you've probably read Don Berwick's article on this topic. If you haven't, you should read it. Um, but and I think you know, getting back to a comment Joan made, you know, the other reason why it's important to look at the whole care continuum is we've increasingly, because of these concerns with you know fundability and, and affordability in health systems, we've moved more and more care outside of hospitals into ambulatory settings. I mean, I I like I see things that like when I started my career, they never would have thought of doing a hip or knee replacement on an outpatient basis. I mean, that's like, what, <laughs> you know, are you serious? And so they, they, they continually move these things out. And I, I, I don't know that, you know, you make the comment and allege that the hospitals have reduced staffing for profitability issues. And I think, you know, there are nurse staffing ratios and, and there in some states, there are laws and regulations about sort of where you can go with that. But I will tell you, I had a personal experience my youngest son was diagnosed with a rare form of lymphoma last year and he had to have inpatient chemo. And I sat in his room at the Mayo Clinic, one of the best, you know, you think, okay, this is like top of the line here. Okay. And we're in the unit. I said, I can count at least five patient safety risks that I'm looking at right now, including the fact that because of, you know, reduced staffing in the facility, which they couldn't fill, they were trying to fill those positions. Um, they were bringing in nurses who didn't have any training in chemo, delivering the chemo medicine. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think it's a multitude of problems with the staffing issues. Um, are there bad actors? I'm sure there are. Um, you know, but in many cases, they simply can't hire people. And especially if you think about like rural places where people don't want to live and people are escaping those areas. I think, you know, in areas where there's high competition, I was in Portland, Oregon and Kaiser um, before I came to Pittsburgh. And in Portland, Oregon, it was almost as if the nurses sort of shifted around, you know, between Providence and Legacy and Kaiser, you know, because as soon as they could get a better deal, and the same thing happened when I was in North Carolina between UNC and Duke, you know, Duke would give a pay raise and so all the nurses would go over there. <laughs> you know, so there, there are instabilities that are not just on the part of decisions that the health systems make. It's also, you know, workers trying to get the best possible um, salaries to support their families and, and this, this migration out of the field. You know, because it's not, you know, the a lot of times, you know, you go into healthcare because you want to help people and do the right things. Well, if you become, you know, a slave to your computer, you know, entering information in and doing all the billing and kinds of stuff and your the time with your patients gets shrunk. Um, there are all these other stressors that have influenced, and I'm sure as a practicing ED physician in a pediatric hospital, you know, the the burnout, you know of just the long hours you work and the unsavory working conditions that you have. I would add, you know, on behalf of my daughter, my daughter who's a nurse, that part of the reason she left was because of a hospital system that gave her a 2% raise during COVID while the health, all the executives and administrators got multi-million dollar raises. So I'll you know, show myself as being pure socialist here, but, and she left and she went to a place where she was paid better. So yeah, my housekeeper is a nurse. Yeah. She left nursing because she said the people whose houses she cleans give her more gratitude for doing that. 
I mean, these are sad times and we've got to figure this out. How do we, how do we give people the respect and the credibility to be in these professions? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. That's beyond the scope of our committee. Um, but if you find out, let me know. Okay, just a couple minutes left in this, uh, this topic. Uh, come on, Europe. Um, wonderful discussion. I'm taking furious notes. Uh, firstly, uh, Dr. Savitz, uh, thank you for sharing your personal story and I hope your son is feeling better. Your comment prompted me to think about something. There was a recent article in Becker's Healthcare which talked about how the hospitals that were on immediate jeopardy last year, um, a, a, a substantial portion of them had top safety ratings according to a public sort of safety rating. And so as reflecting on the conversation we had earlier today about sort of care experience and patient-centered outcomes, I think there's an interesting sort of opportunity here, you know, uh, to think about, you know, how do we sort of align what is happening on the ground with some of these sort of public ratings that exist? Yeah, I mean, some of the rating systems gave people a pass during COVID. I mean, so there was that. And, you know, I've, <clears throat> I'm, I was very privileged in my career to work with um, Brent James, who's continued to be a mentor of mine over the years. And you know, one, one of the things he talks about is just because you get a good rating, it just means you're you know, the cream of the crap. Um, <laughs> and I quote him on that. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's like, you know, we all know what some of these ratings are. And you know, we've sat on the technical expert panels and we say, you know, is, does five star really tell you about quality? <laughs> um, so I, you know, it, depends on the rating and it depends on what people are doing. They tend to be branding tools that people use, frankly. But thank you for your comments. Um, David, let's close us out on this, this one. I want to acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, protecting healthcare workers safety is also related to patient safety in the entire mm -hmm. uh, environment. And I just want yeah. to um, acknowledge that our work group um, discussed a couple of things, including recognizing that Protecting healthcare workers vulnerable to workplace related violence is a difficult problem with multiple underlying root causes and varying societal responses, both at the state and local mm -hmm. institutional levels. That one thing we could do is make sure that we're providing an evaluation and support for safe safety response best practices in environments where clinical care is delivered. And then also above that, uh, provider training and skills to manage high risk situations because some providers, mm -hmm. again, take that risk home with us, especially as you might imagine yeah. in rural areas where people not only know our home address, but also yeah. which vehicle we drive. So they know if we're staffing mm -hmm. the ER that day or not. And then additionally, um, having a rapid response plan ready at the facility level and whether or not there are resources available uh, for this in place already, but being able to identify those and recognizing that provider safety is also mm -hmm. patient safety. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're reading something. So if you could email that to me, that'd be great to, <laughs> to have. I would really appreciate it. And I will say, I didn't go through, you know, all the information that we sent to you in advance, but in our principles, one of the things that we said is that um, the human connection between patients with their families and caregivers and healthcare providers is, a ful is the fulcrum of a person-centered safe care. It's really that relationship that exists that's really important and not to lose the humanity of those interactions. I, I agree with you. That's very important. Thank you. Okay, we are over time on this topic and we actually have to uh, call the vote. So you all uh, got to see the... Um, Recommendations from the SNAC on uh, the strategic direction of the National Action Alliance to advance patient and work, workforce safety. Um, and, and so it's given that it's a recommendation from a, a subcommittee of this body, um, in order for that recommendation to be accepted, we have to um, vote to, uh, to um, receive and approve those recommendations. So do I hear a call for approval? Moved to approve. Moved. Second. And seconded. Anyone opposed to those recommendations from the SNAC? Um, so to vote, I'm looking to make sure. Okay, in order to vote, because we actually have to pull each uh, NAC member, raise your hand in the um, Zoom and we'll, we'll count your votes. You are not in favor, do not raise your hand. Okay. 
Okay. Keep your hands raised while we while we um, tabulate here. We are good to go and it looks like it um, has been approved. Um, thank you all um, and thank you for, thank uh, you. for presenting thank this topic. Thank you everybody, topic. I really appreciate it. Very good, all right. Uh, so before we go to our next uh, next topic, I did, rec uh, as I'm looking at my Zoom, I did recognize that we have our um, ex officio CDC representative, Mike Bell is on. So just wanted to uh, acknowledge um, Mike being on um, uh, representing CDC. Um, our next topic is another snack. So this uh, this uh, snack is is going to you know give us an update on um, on their focus area, which has been um, the uh, patient centered outcomes research trust fund investments. So uh, who's going to take this? I think Karen's going to. I think Karen's going to take this. Yeah. All right. So uh, Karen's going to jump in on this one and and, and give us a. Um, uh, a little conversation. Karen, for those who don't know, is uh, is our uh, chief implementation officer um, here at ARC. And I think Karen's going to introduce the other folks. Karen, all yours. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, really great to be here in person and to see so many people and um, I am going to, this is uh, really to cover the recommendations of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Portfolio Subcommittee, uh, which we call a snack. So PCOR Trust Fund snack. Let's see if I can uh, move this. This one? Oh. Okay, that's me. <laughs> um, so I am going to provide an incredibly brief overview of the Patient uh, Centered Outcomes Trust Fund and where we are in our uh, strategic uh, planning and, um, and the role of the SNAC uh, in providing external stakeholder input into how we invest our resources. Then I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Dr. Mike Doolin, who is our snack facilitator, who will introduce the snack members and describe the processes that they went through uh, to address their charge and summarize their recommendations. Then you're gonna hear a little bit, just a bit about our hot off the presses notice of intent from uh, Dr. Uh, Tess Miller. Uh, who is director of our Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement. And I will note that this was publicly released after the SNAC had finalized its recommendations, but I hope they'll be happy with it. Uh, so then finally, we have some questions for the NAC and you will, just like you did, vote approval of the SNAC recommendations. And then, um, including whether or not you want to continue the SNAC for one more year going forward? And if so, do you wanna update its charge? So, so. there, sorry, you told me that I'm talking there. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the PCOR Trust Fund was established under the Affordable Care Act uh, to improve getting evidence-based care uh, into practice and specifically care that patients uh, cared about and where they wanted uh, uh, that would be valuable to patients and providers and their families. So. Um, it was uh, reauthorized and uh, up through 2029, the funds are uh, come from a tax on insurers and um, they are split. 80% goes to the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Tr Institute, PCORI, and um, to do comparative effectiveness research. 
Aspie uh, at HHS, um, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, gets 4% to build the data infrastructure for this research. And ARC gets 16% for dissemination of evidence, making sure it's understood and used, and also for training the next generation of patient-centered outcomes researchers. And um, this amounts to about 100 million a year, so over a 10-year period, a billion. And um, unlike appropriated funds, which have to be spent in the year in which they're appropriated, which is becoming increasingly short with, uh, with ongoing uh, you know, uh, CRs on the part of Congress, um, this money can be rolled over and spent over a much longer period of time. And this allows for strategic planning. And um, so um, we have uh, created a strategic framework, which you will see shortly uh, in Mike's presentation. And we did this uh, with extensive uh, ex internal and external stakeholder engagement. And we are now at the stage of implementation planning. Don't worry, we, have, we are spending money and you will see some very exciting stuff coming forward uh, shortly, I hope. Um, and so this is um, the point at which I turn it over to uh, Mike Doolin. And I just want, I believe you have his full bio, correct? In your read ahead but I wanna point out that we're incredibly lucky to have him. And uh, he's a practicing family physician and director of the Academy for Population Health Innovation at UNC. He's been a research director and chair of Carolina's Healthcare Systems Department of Family Medicine, where he founded and directed a primary care practice-based research network. Um, and he, in 2021, he was a fellow at the National Academy of Medicine where he supported and uh, was a health um, aide to the House of Representative uh, Energy and Commerce Committee working on policy issues uh, related to COVID-19, public health, data infrastructure, social determinants, mental health and health information technology, an area where he is considered a leader in the field. So um, Mike, with that, I turn this over to you. Great, thank you very much, Karen. I really appreciate the kind introduction. And it's an honor to be here today. I should mention that first PBRN was funded by ARC. Uh, my very first funding, David Myers was my program official. And um, so I'm delighted to be back here and uh, provide service to ARC. You made a huge difference in my career. Um, and I promise, Lucy Savitz is a really hard act to follow. I promise not to mention anything about capitalism today. <laughs> um, I'm also delighted and honored to represent our committee. Um, we had a, a wonderful committee. Over half the committee was reformulated. This is our second year. Um, am I on? Up? OK, all right. Um, and uh, we had two members of the, the SNAC. Uh, Neil and David, thank you very much for your service on the committee. Please keep me honest today with the presentation. Um, and we also, we reformulated the committee to be broader this last year. We had two patient representatives on the committee as well. Um, here's the list of the committee. The full names and bios are in the final report. Our snack was, uh, our snack charge was changed slightly from the first year and these areas are indicated in red. Uh, we continued, as Karen mentioned, uh, to use the strategic framework from ARC as our lens as we did the work through the year. Uh, but we did look to um, understand how that portfolio aligned with the ARC strategies. We looked for innovative approaches and methods, including digital health and clinical decision support to drive and improve success of dissemination and implementation activities. Uh, we also looked to target communication, dissemination, and implementation of PCOR evidence that was derived uh, through ARC's investments through the PCOR Trust Fund. Um, and a note here in red, again, was including strategies for ongoing stakeholder engagement. And then finally, to look at innovations and training and how to best assure diversity and equity and inclusion in that process. 
Uh, like um, the safety committee, we had four meetings. Uh, they were pretty rapid and processed, particularly the last two. Um, and uh, we started with a kickoff and charge. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valdez, for welcoming us as well. Uh, as we started off the committee, uh, we looked at portfolio evaluation. And I, I should acknowledge the team, I'm sorry, Karen, but we also had Elena Fournier, one of the, um, the, the senior advisors from ARC, and Amy also was a key member of our team working really hard behind the scenes to make sure that these meetings happened uh, and we got the best feedback from the committee possible. Um, our third meeting focused on dissemination and implementation. We got presentations from a number of the different ARC staff members. And then our final meeting, uh, we looked at the aging portfolio and stakeholder engagement, as well as made determinations about our recommendation. Like the Patient Safety Committee, we surveyed the committee. We also got them to rank order the recommendations, and we're going to provide them to you today in terms of priority and that order that they provided. I would also say that the committee was very engaged. Uh, we had offshoots from the committee to go and do additional work in, in various areas. We had writing groups that formed around various areas as well. Uh, so there was a lot of work from this committee and it was really just a delight for me to be able to, to work with that committee and learn from them over this short period of time. Um, this is again, the overview of the strategic plan and this is the framework that the committee used as we looked at our recommendations and made those recommendations. Um, and part of our year one work was to look at this and provide input on that strategic plan before it was published. Our final recommendations came in three areas. Uh, the first in the area of primary care transformation. And again, this was the priority uh, based on feedback from the committee. After that was health equity. And third was stakeholder engagement and partnership models. Um, that, that first one, again, primary care, we had a subgroup that formed spontaneously from the committee to drive this idea of a primary care comparative performance initiative. This was driven after we saw the uh, healthcare system performance initiative presented by ARC. The committee was very impressed by that work and felt like there could be a, a nice opportunity to really focus on primary care in this space and to advance the knowledge of primary care delivery itself. And I heard previously the, the discussion about new methods of care delivery, telemedicine, new, new um, partners that are getting into this space from private equity. How do we really look and see what is the best way to deliver primary care and compare that against existing models uh, so that we can move the needle forward in that space? Uh, the second was to address issues of access and health equity in primary care as primary care itself being a mechanism where we can overcome disparities in health outcomes. And finally, to develop metrics and incentives with key partners like CMS, our, our new and novel partners uh, like payers, uh, to drive incentives to really move the needle and push people towards sustainable primary care change. The second area of importance for our committee was this area of health equity. Uh, where we were looking to really align the PCOR trust fund investments or recommend that alignment with opportunities. So where are inequities in healthcare happening, both in access and outcomes, and how do we align the investments to make a difference in that space? How do we also align these investments so that they build community capacity so non-traditional partners get funding from ARC um, and can build their capacity and, and do the work that's needed uh, for populations that are uh, underserved by our system? And then finally, to inclusively redefine those priority populations and really to say, what does it mean to have a health equity lens as we look at this portfolio? Um, and then last is stakeholder engagement. And here we felt like all fundees that receive money through the PCOR Trust Fund should have some type of stakeholder engagement plan that's done on a universal basis. It should be a requirement for participation that stakeholders are at the table so that they can have a voice and help make a difference and guide the process. We also identified other best practices, um, and there are a number of them, but including PCORI itself, in terms of how stakeholder engagement should work, uh, and recommended adopting those best practices rather than reinventing the wheel. And finally, to think of metrics and incentives to evaluate and sustain impact. And again, this would be a partnership model looking at CMS or other non-traditional partners to really think through how do we incentivize and create change uh, that, that persist. And this includes the change of having stakeholders at the table. And my, my final recommendation, and this is not in the slide, but the SNAC did recommend that we continue on as part of this engagement process itself. Um, it is my real pleasure. Uh, hopefully you have all seen our notice of intent 
that was released not too long ago. Um, I'm being told, no, no, I have to get on camera. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and really with that, ARC uh, is uh, announcing a future initiative that we intend to fund and create a healthcare extension service program. We'll do that by funding state-based cooperatives. Um, and those cooperatives really have several um, functions or uh, activities that we intend for them to do. First and foremost, to convene a, a wide variety of public and private um, stakeholders that um, will work together to address barriers at the state level as well as local levels. Um, the stakeholders we will include um, a wide variety, as I said, that are important in each state, but definitely um, the state Medicaid program, health systems, other organizations that provide health. I'm oh, sorry, I still am not. <laughs> I'll be done before I'm on camera. Um, <laughs> this is a very high level description of what we intend to fund. Um, and, and so, as I mentioned, they will come together, the cooperatives will convene the stakeholders to really try to address barriers to the delivery of high quality, high value care in the state and focused around payment, technology, workforce and implementation issues. In addition, they, the cooperatives will provide extension services to really help health systems, practices, clinicians, also communities engage in dissemination and implementation of evidence-based practices. Our hope is that through the extension service, we will reduce the time it takes for new actionable evidence to get into clinical practice, as Dr. Valdez mentioned earlier. We're also hoping that we'll create an ongoing um, infrastructure, if you will, at the state level to really build the capacity for them to use evidence to um, increase and improve the quality of care. Thank you. You guys good? Okay. Um, so that's the, you guys have, there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of background work and reading um, uh, associated with this um, report out uh, and and um, in list of recommendations, let's call on the representative for Group Three to report out on their discussion regarding uh, this this work. Who's who is that? Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, so honestly, we when we're looking at the um, the first question, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Enjoyed it. Really loved the work, and I feel like it's resonating with me so much. So thank you so much, and it's so important. So um, as far as like the answering the questions, we felt like let me I have to go back to that question. Can you put the question? Back? The first question, whether or not, yes, does um, it align with the strategic framework? We thought that it aligned with the strategic framework. So that was pretty simple to answer. And um, we thought that there was um, there was a question and comments around, um, is there a way to look at the overlap of the snacks, the two snacks? So is there an overlap between um, developing the infrastructure around the learning health system and then looking at the um, infrastructure for PCOR? Um, and, and is there, even from an ambulatory standpoint, is there a way for the infrastructure um, to overlap and work together? So that was one of our comments. Um, we also thought about um, just looking at um, data and that there's inconsistent knowledge about where the data is. So how do you get to this information? Um, how do you use it? How can it be curated consistently across settings? Um, and then we also talked a little bit about how do we engage stakeholders who are not within certain spaces? And I know we've talked about that a lot today, but specifically those that are outside of the academic health system, because you're thinking about who gets the funding for this work and how do we reach the people that are not connected to those, to those funding sources? Um, is there a different approach? Um, and then also we talked about like making sure that as we're developing this work that we're not developing parallel systems, that we're not siloing information, but that we're continuing to think about how do we integrate things together, kind of like um, the first comment that I made. Team, did I miss anything? Thank you. 
Um, great. So, are there thank, thanks for that report out? Are there any um, any other groups that wanted to um, add any anything there? Judge, I'll let you jump in here. Um, okay, I have some comments. Mm -hmm. Also, both from our team and also for the specific uh, snack. Uh, my comment is on the primary care uh, delivery. There are two pieces over there. I mean, today we do not talk about, talk about AI. This meeting is not complicated. So I will start two parts. Number one, um, uh, Thomas Friedman, some years back, wrote a book, the, the Earth is Flat, because of the internet. So knowledge got accessible by everyone on Earth who has a computer internet like connection. A lot of things have changed. So today for primary care, I think there are two driving forces that could potentially make the primary care flat. Is it accessible uh, for everyone? Uh, I hope. So number one is telemedicine, right? So that provides the primary care to a lot of people who do not have access. Number two is the, um, the new explosion, this time for real, the AI. Okay, we talked about that for years. This time from, by all measures is a real AI revolution and it has been into some real world industrialized applications, changing everything. So for the primary care part, uh, a lot of machines are more and more capable of doing a lot of things that a primary care provider typically do. So for instance, get a speech transcribed to text and text analyzed by machines. Machines generate some initial diagnosis, a summary of the clinical notes, and even potentially make more recommendations. So that can make the primary care providers more efficient and effective in uh, taking care of more patients. So these two technologies together potentially can make the primary care delivery uh, fundamentally transformed. Yeah, and thanks for drawing that that um, connection. So it was one that uh, I, I saw as well and called out. So I appreciate you pulling that up. Any, you guys want to comment at all to, on that? Sure. And maybe should I start at the beginning of the initial comments and, and then move through? So um, I would say yes. You know, I really enjoyed hearing the other presentation from the stack. Um, and uh, Lucy Savitz used to be on the snack last year too. So there is some kind of natural overlap that exists. And uh, I think there could be some really nice opportunities there. I would also say, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons over the last year in terms of how to improve the approach for engagement of the snack itself. And maybe we could share those between the snacks. And, and um, so certainly I, I think that, would, that seems like a very good idea. Um, you know, the data um, itself and the data across um, areas and sectors, that was a component, you know, I try to give a very high level overview of this primary care uh, component, but one of the thoughts and one of the things that's in the health system uh, comparator is data and you can easily access that data, it's at your fingertips and you can see what types of models work best and how they compare to each other and look at performance over time. Um, there's a lot in the report about um, also working with electronic health record vendors, similar to the discussion we had with patient safety about how do you make it an expectation that data is interoperable, that we improve the quality of the data, and that we um, do a better job with interacting with the data. So yes, absolutely. I think that's a really important component here, both for patient safety and optimizing care delivery itself. Um, the engagement of stakeholders, um, you know, finding systems outside of the traditional partners was an important part of our discussion, and that was behind the building capacity for communities that don't necessarily get to the table in terms of being able to apply. And one of the other comments that came up that came up, I thought was important, which was, you know, we talked about replicating best practices like Corey, but one of the, the members of our team said, well, don't replicate the review process because it's so onerous, it's very scientific. This is not, this is more operational types of work. Mm -hmm. And in certain circumstances, the recipients and building capacity for those recipients is more important than some of the scientific merit of the review process itself. So that, that came up very loud and clear. Um, the silos, uh, again, I think that is important, you know, not to create silos again, but rather figure out how to work across those silos. So, you know, you're suggesting about integrating the committee, but the data itself, and then replicating the, you know, 
the, the committee really enjoyed hearing from the ARC staff and getting the presentations and learning about the exciting work that's happening at ARC. And to be able to, to say, hey, this health systems comparator looks awesome. Why don't we expand it and, and do the same types of work? So instead of building a separate entity, you're thinking through how do we build in parallel or learn the lessons that were learned there. And then the, the comments, I, I really appreciate the comments on primary care as a practicing uh, family physician myself and struggling with electronic health record and um, understanding. And I, I guess I would say, you know, one of the central features I think is important in primary care is the relationship with the patient. You know, you build the trust, you build the relationship. And that doesn't mean that AI can't do it, but can those forces be brought together in a way that takes me away from having to be the data entry person or spend so much time clicking five steps through to be able to put the order in and instead face the individual, create the relationship and use the AI as a way of augmenting my experience and augmenting the patient's experience. So I think that's a really important comment. How do we make it not a forces working against each other, but forces working together to advance care delivery? Uh, that's uh, that's really helpful. I, um, but there were a couple of members of the of the NAC that were on this snack, and um, I'm I'm gonna put uh, David on the spot here because we we had a, a bit of a conversation about one of the points you um, you you uh, um, went a little bit deeper on, which was kind of um, getting some of this work and including the funding out a little bit closer to the you know the real the real folks who are delivering on the ground um, and and really thinking about what what are models around getting that work um, all the way there. Um, and so, David, you want to you want to kind of jump in there? I sure can. Uh, so I think one thing was to consider community based participatory research networks as an example of a modality um, to have community engaged research and that this might be a good example of a method for both study and subsequent implementation of the findings. And the other, I think, at a, uh, another level is just to prioritize stakeholder engagement and effective dissemination, uh, recommending implementation and utilization of those recommendations. And, and this could perhaps, or perhaps should not only could, but should be measured and studied to determine and increase that effectiveness, um, both with regard to the research, but also dissemination and implementation. So I would just say at, at a personal level, um, the new initiative, the Accelerate Implementation of Actionable Evidence into Practice at a more state and local engaged level is exactly um, something that I'm interested in learning more about. And, uh, Neil, you're the other member, right? On it. Can you want to jump in real quick here? Sure. So uh, first, I really want to thank uh, Mike for doing such a great job chairing this large, uh, active, uh, vociferous group, uh, and Karen for reminding us uh, at every meeting what our charge was, uh, because it's really hard to get that kind of group in a room and not having to talk about everything that's wrong with the healthcare system and how we're gonna fix it. Uh, I think what really came to the surface is how much of our comments related to the two things we ended up on, primary care and health equity. Um, and even the intersect, I would say the stakeholder engagement fits in with really both of those. And primary care and equity had a lot of uh, overlap as well. You know, when you look at the safety snack, uh, that was a very specific topic. It's still very broad, but very specific. This was sort of all over the place in terms of where should we be focusing? So I, I would endorse the recommendation to continue the snack, perhaps at a little bit more leisurely pace over the next year to really flesh out this primary care agenda and metrics and, and be much more specific uh, about what we wanna do and what we're recommending. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and that's gonna be important. Let's let's put a, a footnote in that um, when it comes time to uh, accept the recommendations. So Ricky, you're up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't hear you say that. I heard you say you're up and I wasn't sure if it was me. Am I on? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to come back to a more personal comment um, that I didn't say when I first started talking because I got totally frazzled. But um, 
was around Tessa, your comment with the new funding and um, just your conversation around uh, provider extension services and just engaging the community across the state and a little bit about your comment, um, David, as well. Just thinking about, I, I felt like at the beginning of the PCOR funding, there was a restriction on how you did the patient engagement and um, like we shouldn't, or, or not restrictions, but um, people wanted new models, not necessarily models that were in place. If I, I, and I may be remembering this incorrectly, but I know that there's some tried and true things like um, community health workers or people like that, um, navigators that can really make a difference for, for um, closing gaps and addressing folks that don't get traditional care or that there's these gaps that need to be covered in care. And so I wondered if that's something that would be considered as a part of this extension and how that might be embraced going forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so that's one of the areas workforce that we're hoping the stakeholders at the state level will, will really be thinking about could be community health workers, could be um, lay mental health counselors, could be actually somehow centralizing training for EHR support for primary care, for example. So we have a very broad perspective and we're really hoping that the state um, stakeholders will kind of um, from ground up figure out what are their specific workforce needs. Sure. So we're not, um, we don't intend to say okay. what you must do, <laughs> um, but allow the space there for the state to innovate and, and really figure out kind of what is needed at the mm -hmm. state level. Great. Thanks, um, Kathy, you're up. So I, I want to um, I want to amplify what I heard um, related to community based research networks and I heard community health workers. Um, I also want to call out other settings where care is provided in the community. And um, so I think about faith based based communities as well, and also schools. So much health care now is happening within our schools and more of it probably will going will be going forward. And then related to data, I, um, I've, I've brought this um, notion up before. I don't know that we have appropriately tackled the um, the attri attribution for care, um, because so much of our uh, net net our data is captured from billing data, which may or may not be the actual person who provided the care, based on how states. Um, rules are related to billing. So as, we, as we're thinking about really getting into primary care and who provides it and who should provide it, um, it may be a physician, it may not be a physician, it may be an advanced practice nurse. So we, and, and I think we need to get into and really tease that out a little bit and really tease out how our patients are interacting with, engaging with, and what outcomes are being received by differences in, in the way care is provided and differences among teams. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Liz, you're up. <laughs> this is a question for Tess, I think, um, or anyone who's just presented. I'm a little confused about learning networks first that we talked about in the safety snack and the new um, focus on the statewide programs. It, could you just talk a little bit about sort of the difference conceptually and, and, and what you're looking for? Um, is it because the latter is more focused on primary care and the former is more focused on safety? I'm just trying to think about it from, a, from an implementation perspective and having healthcare providers being invited to join networks, which has an activation energy and a, you know, time and money commitment to it. So maybe you could just help tease that apart a little bit. So I'm happy to comment, but invite others at ARC to also comment. Um, the way that I kind of think about that is what we are trying to do through the extension service is really create a learning state. So um, there, you know, the state will consider evidence um, on its critical healthcare needs, its um, you know, barriers to being able to deliver high quality care. That will be informed by people who have been out in the local communities. So bringing that experience back to the state level. So just like in a learning health system, they're learning from how they're delivering care, but also from external evidence. I think we're trying, we're thinking about trying to create that loop at the state level um, so that it will be 
feeding experience from local providers, local health systems, local communities, up to the state level who will be looking at evidence, you know, external evidence, both about ways they might change delivery, um, ways they might organize care differently, how they might use technology differently, that sort of thing. So very simply, um, that's sort of how I see those very related. Thanks. Yeah, I think, and you know what it reminds me of, I think for calling that out, um, Lisa, you know, so I, we, cause we were talking earlier and I think Ron had brought this up, this idea of, um, it was a uh, alert fatigue, right? In the EHR, right? And you got all this, all this stuff and you got to kind of navigate all that. But are we, are we setting ourselves up here for the equivalent of that, especially around primary care, right? So you've got to manage populations. Now we've got all these safety expectations. Now we've got this and now we've got that. And it's just like, primary care has to manage all of these things. And many of these things are coming out of ARC, right? So how are we rationalizing how we how we doing the, the equivalent again in IT of app rationalization um, so that we're not just sending more mandates after folks without really thinking about what can we pull down or what can we condense or what can we pull together in some way? Because I, I thought about that activation energy piece. You said, so where are we do we keep activating over and over all these different things, or are we actually thinking about them as a cohesive whole? Right. Even though we've got we've got three different presentations and, you know, there are actually threads across all of them. Really, we should be thinking about how we pull them all together. Um, and, 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 and it's at a minimum, you know, HHS is a big place, but at a minimum, ARC should be able to, you know, consolidate around around certain topics so that we are not inundated, in, you know, with as providers with all of these expectations and requirements at the same time providing high quality um, in, 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 um, in safe care for those that we serve. Oh, please, yeah. So yeah, th this came up with the committee uh, quite a bit. And uh, you know, as you heard in the safety committee, this idea of de-implementing things that don't work uh, you know, came up as being very important, but also the lack of overall evidence about how to optimize primary care delivery itself. What are the best teams? How to use a community health worker? How do you work with a pharmacist? Which integrated model works best? You know, how, how do you really test those and, and show what is the most effective? And David, I think you made the point on the committee that also that evidence may vary and need to be tailored based on where you're practicing. So if you're in a rural community and you get a recommendation that works in a urban Net network, you might actually make the outcomes worse in that community. So you can't just apply uh, across the entire primary care space the same recommendations. You have to tailor it to the location, the patient population, uh, et cetera. And that was really this idea in this primary care initiative is how do we advance this knowledge so that we have the information we need to create the best possible primary care system for that community. And I love the idea about the community-based participatory research and engagement being the first step in terms of dissemination, because you really need that to build the trust and, and to you know, create that sort of knowledge that allow, that really empowers the community to get the, the care that they need. Thanks for, thanks for that response. Uh, since you're up. Hi, uh, yes. First of all, um, what, what you just said about um, the need to make sure that whatever is being um, promoted or requirements allow for the tailoring to particular communities, exactly for the reasons that you said, you know, it's going to work in, you know, a, a, a Puerto Rican community in New York City is going to be different from what's going to work, you know, in a um, native community in, you know, outside of Santa Fe, right? So it's very important that the, that the, that while we I think there's a lot that can be said about kind of like underlying like process and structure to ensure that there is, you know, real community engagement and real um, stakeholder, that the stakeholders in particular um, in designing and implementing, um, in designing how the implementation is gonna, gonna go uh, actually includes more than just that, you know, one consumer stakeholder, right? That, that the stakeholders are, um, more diverse in that sense. Um, the other thing that I that that I wanted to reinforce is I, I can't remember who exactly said that point, but that when it comes to the primary primary care um, setting, um, the the 
energy right now on primary care transformation is specifically intentionally about that we need to start paying for teams and not to individual doctors, right? Um, and I, full disclosure, I'm on the primary care collaboratives um, board, so I've worked worked in this, um, and that's really important because that is how you create the container for. Do you need more far? You know, do you need a pharmacist in your care team because of X, Y issues happening in the community? Then get get one. Do you need two uh, community health workers um, and one navigator? You know that 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 the point is, and and then of course there's the clinical folks, right? The you know the advanced practice nurse, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so though the we that is something that I'm not sure we have a really good plan for, of how we. Um, study that, right? How do we even capture, uh, because of the billing issues that were raised, you know, what what are these, what these, what do these teams look like? And do it in a way where you're not being prescriptive of what the team has to look like. Thanks, Cincy. Um, Neil, I'm gonna, oh wait, Neil dropped out of the thing. Well, Neil's, Neil pulled a, um, dropped a, a question actually in the chat. Um, uh, asking if the notice of intent um, for the notice of intent, is the intended applicant the state, um, like a state department of health, or like what what is what's that what's that notice of intent? Who who is that focused on? More details to come. Okay, <laughs> can't really talk about that right now. Uh, understood. That that leaves it wide open. All right. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, were there uh, any were there any other um, aspects of this discussion in your in your small groups this morning that has not been brought out or covered in the dis in the discussion? So, in other words, are there or anything that that anyone wants to add that you feel like really should be brought to um, the record? Remember that your discussion from this morning is not part of the official record unless it's actually presented um, in during this discussion. Right. Seeing none, um, there was a recommendation from the the leadership of the snack of this snack to. Um, uh, there were two different um, recommendations. One is to accept their recommendations, and second is to actually have a an extension. So we'll take one at a time. Uh, the first is a vote on um, whether or not to accept the recommendations of this um, PCOR snack. So um, do I hear a motion to call this to question? Moved Second. and seconded. Um, to vote in favor, again, raise your hands on Zoom. To vote against, do not raise your hand. I guess I can vote. Hold please. All right, that passes. Those recommendations are accepted. Um, for the second, it's an approval of another year. My um, my challenge here, and I'd, I'd love for the team to speak up, is um, as you, in your in your presentation, you were you were very clear about what your charge was um, uh, to date. What I'm not sure about is what your charge would be for the extension. So can can you clarify that so we actually know what we're asking you all to do and come back with? All right, I'll try without Karen here since she stepped out, but, oh, Karen's there, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I think particularly the engagement component, you know, over the last year, we brought on additional patient representatives. We tried to broaden the, the number of stakeholders that are on this um, committee and to think of them as a component of the stakeholder engagement itself as we, you know, take a look at the various um, implementation of the investments across the, 
uh, PCOR Trust Fund. And, you know, I would say, I, I think it was a nice opportunity for us to see the work happening at ARC, but it also provided an opportunity for the ARC staff to organize themselves, to bring forward uh, presentations to us and to get feedback in real time. The, the snack did bring up questions and ideas and thoughts as the, uh, the ARC team presented to them. Yeah, you know, I think the other thing as happened in the safety committee, we didn't bring recommendations in terms of how this would happen. So to think through and the and the team, again, it was a real honor to represent the team. A lot of people with great ideas across the various stakeholders. You know, I think it would be important to get their ideas as things move into the next stage of implementation. And also the, the latest, this very exciting extension opportunity has just arisen, but it would also give the snack an opportunity to learn more about that. We didn't actually have the opportunity. Our last meeting happened before that presentation of this new uh, funding announcement came through or funding opportunity came through. So it would also give the snack an opportunity to better understand and uh, potentially provide some, some thoughts on implementation there too. Aaron, did I cover that okay? I think you covered that. Um, one of our strategic framework, if you look at it, has ongoing, meaningful stakeholder engagement throughout. We can't hear anything. If you want to pull up the strategic framework. So one of our goals uh, on the strategic framework based on extensive stakeholder input, if you wanna to go to that. Other way <laughs> is on, ongoing, keep, oh, there you go. Sort of uh, stakeholder engagement that is sustained, interactive and meaningful. And so if the snack is one component, but one of our questions is, and we would charge the snack to identify additional ways of getting that broad stakeholder input. I mean, we tried very hard to have a really good diverse snack. We turned over about half of the people in the second year and it was nice to have different perspectives. So sort of similar to the NAC does. Um, so we would welcome input into that. But I think if we're going to have that, we want to figure out how to do, you know, that stakeholder engagement and also keep that equity lens on everything we're doing. So getting external input, feedback, especially as we develop a very large national initiative that we hope will be a model for the rest of the country if it goes well. It might be very nice to have a ongoing snack. And um, I would add that that charge that they should, you know, once things are more public, that they ought to give more, you know, feedback on it, as well as on all of our other projects. So, um, yeah, thank we we appreci would appreciate it. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I understood. I, I, want to, I want to be a little bit. I want to be concrete about our, our use of, of, of a subcommittee um, approach for this. Um, it's it's uh, we don't you don't go into into spinning up snacks lightly. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're very we're very concrete about about what we're asking and what we're expect, expecting because there's accountability around that, right? Um, and there's resources spent um, um, on that. Um, and Neil Neil had to run um, uh, back home, but um, one of the things that he had, he had mentioned was this idea of um, fleshing out the primary care agenda and metrics. Um, I, and I it kind of added based on some of the conversation, um, including a focus on, on health equity. Um, and as well as um, there's potential opportunities to expand some of the stakeholder engagement recommendations. Um, uh, David had mentioned that in, in, um, in, our, in our subcommittee, I mean, not subcommittee, in our, in our pre-work meeting this morning. So, um that i think that's tangible enough to to um to put to put some real meat um on the bones here um i i would be comfortable with that but i'm going to defer to the rest of the rest of the council here to, if, if to see if we feel one you can you know comment um but to see if you feel that that is um a legitimate and substantive charge 
for this uh, for this snack to be extended. Um, I, I did quickly saw Liz jump in if you wanted to speak. Well, I don't feel that I have enough context to know how to vote for this. Is this a, an outlier or is this routine um, when a subcommittee is done that they can get extended? I, it seems to me without understanding the trade-offs, um, it's hard to vote or, or the other norms. Um, sure, let me jump in here. So. I I agree with that and just an additional question and I'm sorry I jump in but since you're going to be answering I think you can cover it all. Um, I also like um, what I, I feel like I need to understand a little bit better like what is the um, you know what are the norms around putting it together about in terms of like composition and like you mentioned specifically about how the fact that there were some fake folks leaving allowed you to bring new people are you expecting that that's going to be part of it as well um and uh what is a concrete output that um is expected like very very clearly okay so let me let me try to tackle a little bit of this um so the way um, subcommittees of advisory councils generally work is that there is a very defined charge and they're limited, they are time limited. So we don't tend, we have, with the, with the, other than this snack, um, the PCOR trust fund snack, we have never had an ongoing snack. Um, it is a way for us to get strategic advice um, for the NAC to get strategic advice and for us to then report that out to the public. So uh, there, there are other approaches to getting um, feedback, including convening TEPs, for example, um, other potential research projects. Some of those are some of those are um, more more cost prohibitive than others, but it the snack provides a way to do that, right? But we have to be very clear about what a charge is and what the purpose is, and again, needs to be time limited. And then we assess as a, as, a, as, a, as a board here, whether or not we believe this is a good use of funds of, and, and, is, and we're actually getting really good strategic advice from it. If we're, if we're not, then we should, we meaning you all should, should not vote for it. Can you just clarify the technical expert panel versus SNAC difference? Yeah, so um, technical expert panels are, Basically, when a there's a competitive process in, in some way for a entity that has a technical expertise. So, for example, a RAND, a you know one of those kinds of organizations could manage, um, could pull together a group and get a grant or get a contract to do that. Versus a a snack, which doesn't have to is not subject to, again, FACA regulations because they report back to the National Advisory Council. It allows them to meet, allows them to pull together lots of different people in a quick way and allows them to report um, to report out to the NAC. And it's the NAC who makes the final recommendations. So again, thanks, thanks for your... Um... Questions? Yes, I think that's right. Uh, I think I think on both points that you made in your in your uh, in your comments, I think you're right on both points there. So um, you know, based on the feedback that I'm hearing, I, I you know it would have been if you guys had come with a, a very clear and crisp charge moving forward, including the time delineation, that would have been one thing. But we're not we're not sure what we're voting for, um, and so I think that's that's really I think that's the recommendation I'm hearing, which is like tell us exactly what you want to do, and then we can we can actually assess that. Go for it, Kurt. So um, we're in the process of doing a very in-depth portfolio analysis, having a group that sort of really understands our, you know, our authorizations and what we can do and actually helps us to define some implementation outcomes. And are we meeting those and seeing if we actually meet the goals of the framework and helps us think through what uh, an overall evaluation across the portfolio would be. Um, and are we investing this public money in a way that has the most impact? 
Uh, and we only have, we have one more year on the contract. So I would say this is one more year that would, during a very busy time of implementation where we're rolling out numerous brand new programs, both on the DNI and training and some others as well. Um, it would be great to have that kind of feedback ongoing. It doesn't, um, you know, and one of the things the snack could also do is help advise as to how we get that ongoing external stakeholder after they're done or even during. So I would say one year time and uh, let's, you know, uh, really focus on analysis and impact and metrics that uh, will define our impact. I just want to be very clear that this would not be for programmatic oversight. No. It is, I would be fine. I, I think it's fine and reasonable to flesh out um, deeper agenda metrics um, and that such, but it is again to get advice to our National Advisory Council who makes that ultimate decision and recommendation. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to make a call here. I, I, I really need y'all to go, you know, kind of put your heads together, come back with a very crisp charge, um, and then give us something to, to respond to. Um, I, I just think we're, we're trying to work our way through it here and this is not right the setting, quite the setting to do that. Um, so that, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be our recommendation. Okay. So that's for The snack has one more meeting. Uh, that'll probably happen, I think, February or March. And maybe we could have them really focus on that and report back to the next uh, NAC with the, uh, answering your request. I think that's very reasonable. So um, then, what's what's on the what's on the table now um, for that? That'll be up for vote. Then is um, to uh, extend this conversation essentially to our March meeting of the NAC, um, and at which time the SNAC will come back with again those um, uh, which those um, uh, that charge that crisp charge that we're that we're going to respond to and be able to vote on for an extension of the snack um that in, in, in included in this is um allowing the snack to continue to operate until that meeting in march um into our, our next national advisory council meeting which will be in march 2024. okay so again the the vote is um the the snack to continue its its work until um and then report back to us in march 2024 um at that time they will report back with um a recommendation about their extension including exactly what the charge would be um there may be one issue that in order to uh, move the that we have to have certain documents in place in order to be able to extend it so we could make that uh i don't know um conditional and then stop it if necessary. Well, right. we, we'll, yeah. we can figure yeah. that part. We can figure. Yeah, exactly. We'll, okay, we'll table that. But I think for the purposes, we, we can manage the work outside of this. Okay, for the purposes of recommendations, yep. and having authority to continue, we have until March. Okay. For that report. Thank you. So again, I want to I want to clarify what we're what we're voting on. Um, for this snack um, around PCOR to continue its its work. Um, uh, until the NAC meeting in March 2024, at which time we will reassess the recommendations and and um, and vote accordingly. All right, understood. Um, For that, whatever you said. Okay. I, I couldn't hear. Sorry, since you went in and out, I, I only caught like part of what you said. I was just saying, I move. Okay. All right. So we got one. Uh, any any second? Thank you. Uh, so we moved in, seconded. Um, 
all those in favor of that, please again, vote by raising your hand on the Zoom. Opposed, do not raise your hand. We will capture this. Hands raised, thank you. Um, that motion No, okay. All right, so that that passes. I just got. I just had, I was just checking the numbers. Gotcha. Yeah, and we have quorum. All right. All right. So that passes. Thank you all. Um, so, thank you. Cool. Um, um, so let's go to our our, our next uh, next uh, topic here, which is going to be public comment. I believe we had two um, uh, public. Um, Comment uh, requests. Uh, remember, they are how much time do we have? You have three minutes. All right, remember that. Yeah, three minutes each. We'll start with uh, Shannon Davila from ECRI. All right, there we go. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shannon Davila, uh, Director of Total System Safety at ECRI. Um, thank you to the National Advisory Council for this opportunity to speak. On behalf of ECRI, an ARC-listed patient safety organization and evidence-based practice center, I would like to bring attention to an important diagnostic safety issue and urge the council and leaders at ARC to continue to support engagement and safety efforts around vulnerable populations, including military veterans. A critical aspect to achieving total system safety is designing a healthcare delivery system that facilitates equitable care for all patients. A major component of this is building a partnership between patients, families, and healthcare providers. Patients and families should be actively involved in care making decisions and partners in improving healthcare safety, including diagnostic safety, which by one study accounts for nearly 60% of all medical errors experienced by patients. Patient and family engagement is one of the four foundational drivers of the National Action Plan to Advance Patient Safety and a priority focus of the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology Report, um, the transformational effort on safety. Developing strong patient provider relationships has become even more complex when forging partnerships with vulnerable populations who may have risk factors for significant health problems that go unrecognized, such as individuals who serve in the military. The environment in which military service personnel live and work create risks for a wide array of health conditions. Without an effective process to assess for these risks, healthcare providers are potentially missing opportunities to properly diagnose and treat veterans. Toxic exposure related injuries have become a growing concern in the military veteran population. Veterans exposed to burn pits, radiation, Agent Orange, and other toxic materials during their military service are at risk for a multitude of health conditions. In August of 2022, the Sergeant First Class, Heath Robinson, honoring our promise to address comprehensive toxins, or the PACT Act, became federal law and expands VA health care and benefits to veterans exposed to, uh, exposed to burn pits and other toxins. It is largely regarded as the most significant advance, excuse me, expansion of VA health coverage for toxic exposures in 30 years. In addition to toxic exposure risks, mental health risks are also a top concern for veterans. Now, while the VA health system has structures in place to meet the unique needs of veterans, the civilian healthcare sector largely does not, creating inequities for those veterans that seek their health care outside of the VA health system. By taking a total systems approach to safety, healthcare leaders, including those within the civilian and VA health systems, should examine the system factors and contribute and, and how those contribute to failures and how healthcare providers assess and manage the unique health needs, including diagnostic needs of veterans. ECRI wants to acknowledge the work that ARC has done in recent years to advance implementation of diagnostic safety. And we urge Dr. Valdez, as other leaders, to continue to focus on improving engagement of patients and diagnostic safety for those vulnerable patient populations, including military veterans. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Next up on public comment is uh, Aaron Abend from uh, ARI. Thank you very much. 
Um, my name is Aaron Aben. I'm the executive director of the Autoimmune Registry Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit umbrella organization that provides a hub for research statistics and patient data on all autoimmune diseases. We also aim to become a trusted source where patients with these diseases can find credible, scientifically supported information about their diseases, promising treatments in the pipeline, and accurate prognosis insights. Whenever necessary, we will redirect patients to our patient advocacy partners for further resources and information. Autoimmune diseases affect an estimated 16 million people in the United States, and as a group are the seventh leading cause of death for women between 15 and 65. Our list of over 160 diseases include 106 for which there is clear evidence of autoantibodies, T cell activation, or other measurable immune dysfunction. But just as important are over 50 conditions, maybe not yet really diseases, where there is a lack of understanding of their cause, but they are suspected by many in the public as being autoimmune, in part because they affect women twice as often as men. More research on all of these diseases is needed. The quality of the diagnostic process in particular is poor for many of those with autoimmune disease. They go for five or 10 years even uh, without a correct diagnosis. My mother went for 10 years without a correct diagnosis of her Sjogren's disease. We asked AHRQ to consider research on these conditions to re reduce and to track and reduce the time of diagnosis, compute prevalence statistics, and ensure that these diseases receive the attention of healthcare providers and that they receive the appropriate funding needed to improve upon existing treatment protocols and disease management strategies. The autoimmune registry can help represent the voice of the patients in this work. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, that is uh, the conclusion of the public comment component of our meeting. Um, now we have the chair's wrap up and I will use my time uh, to um, public publicly thank the NAC members who are rotating off um, the council uh, this month. Um, I wanna, uh, so one, uh, I'll give you guys some time to think if you have any um, departing thoughts, um, a summary thoughts, a charge for the NAC or for ARC as a whole moving forward. Um, please uh, kind of gather those thoughts. Um, and, and, but I'll start with uh, David. Well, first of all, I just wanna say thank you to the staff and, and thank you for this opportunity. I've hopefully I've contributed some, but I'm sure and certain that I've learned even more. Um, and, and I think that um, I just want to make a comment that we've heard quite a bit about rural and I, for those of you who may or may have not had the benefit of living in rural America, I just want to tell you it's a wonderful place to live, to work, and to care for one another. So I would encourage you all to consider that. Um, in my uh, separating from the NAC, I would just say, please think with a rural lens uh, in your considerations and deliberations. I think that it's important uh, in this way to avoid unintentional negative consequences for those that are most vulnerable and differentially impacted in rural America. So it seems only appropriate that uh, I've had the opportunity to celebrate National Rural Health Day with all of you today. So thank you. Thanks, thanks David. Um, Andy. Thank you. I'm going to echo David a little bit. I uh, just thank you to Edmondo for nominating me. Thank you to the ARC staff for uh, kind of keeping me on track with my various paperwork issues. And um, again, a, a situation where I feel like I learned more from you all than uh, you learned from me. I mean, it's kind of weighty to ask me to give you a charge at ARC, but I will say that um, a theme for me as I've been participating is the, the amount of change that's going on in healthcare delivery the digital digitization of healthcare, decentralization of care, team-based care, it really poses big challenges to how we measure healthcare, how we measure satisfaction, safety, all these things we've been talking about today. The thing like when you're when you're not in a hospital, when you're not in a clinic all the time, how do you measure patient satisfaction and attribution is a big issue. Um, and also really like struggling with what if you ask five people what a learning health system is, you get 12 answers. So I think that would be an important thing for ARC to really get it's handle a handle on if we're going to make that a strategy going forward. I could go on for a while longer, but those are themes that came up for me today. And again, I'll just thank you all and 
wish you all a safe travel home. Please keep in touch. Thanks, Andy. Um, Caroline had to drop early. Um, Mire had to drop early, um, but Kathy is still here. <laughs> Learned a tremendous amount, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to um, to serve with you all. Um, my charge, of course, is um, I I feel like I I am passionate about bringing the voice to, of the nurse to the NAC. And, um, and we, as the largest um, group among the healthcare workforce, um, and the reason that folks are hospitalized, if they are hospitalized, is to receive nursing care. Uh, um, our, the voice of the nurse is really, really important and will be important as we think about all things related to primary care, cost of care, cost effectiveness, patient safety, uh, and, and every other aspect of the healthcare domain. So I, I thank you for letting me bring that voice and I encourage you to make sure that it's present in your work. Thank you, Kathy, for bringing that voice. Um, I don't think we had Henry. So Jodrika, you're, uh, you're bringing us home here. Well, <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you very much for this experience. And like others have said, I feel like I've probably learned more than, than I've uh, shared, uh, but hopefully I've been influential in a very positive way. Um, you know, as I think about like what's like what I'm passionate about, that's health equity. So I am very proud that ARC is very passionate about that as well. So I would say continue to focus on valuing all people. Um, and as Dr. Kamara Jones says, provide resource according to need, which I think that that really fits well. And then really rectify and correct any kinds of um, injustices or things that don't, don't flow well for people to have a good access to healthcare. The other thing that I'm really important, it's really important to me is physician well-being. And I know that I've pushed that a little bit because I think that every space where we think about how we can make things better for our patients, it really is going to require the, the physician to be well, which really falls in line with the quadruple aim. So I, I encourage you all to continue to think about that, the quadruple aim. And then lastly, um, I wear my academic hat <laughs> and, you know, everything that we do, we want to make sure that we um, touch our undergraduate and, and graduate medical education. My last words uh, would be, be the change you want to see in the world. Some of my favorite quotes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, start to uh, thank you all again. Um, one, um, uh, thanks again for, for your, your time on the council. And it's been very um, uh, powerful for me to have such um, engaged and um, experienced and passionate uh, um, people on this, on this council. I really appreciate your time. Um, paperwork or aside, um, in terms of, uh, of what you bring to the to the table, um, I also want to make sure I, I um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Director Valdez as well as uh, Craig Umshid, um, Karen Ginsburg, Ron Hayes, uh, Susan Edgman, uh, Leviton, Lucy Savitz, and Karen Rhodes, uh, Mike Dillon, and uh, Tess Miller for all of, for their presentations, um, and also for the NAC members, um, everyone who joined the meeting, um, both in person as well as. Um, online, as well as the public, I saw 100 plus people um, actively um, listening in uh, to this to this meeting. I want to close the meeting out with Kamal's haiku. <laughs> she had to drop off, but she every meeting has a haiku based on um, based on uh, the the themes of the meeting. She absolutely has a haiku. So um, her haiku goes, lots of cross-cutting action needed for safer person-centeredness. Uh, so that's how we will uh, close. Um, the next NAC meeting will